wanna we'll um we'll begin with a prayer. We're so organized here. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Come, Holy Ghost, with the hearts of thy faithful, and enkindle in the fire of thy love, send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created. And thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, by the light of the Holy Spirit, just instruct the hearts of the faithful. Grant that with the same spirit we may have right judgment in all things, that every to rejoice in his consolations. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Let us pray. Direct the Lord, we beseech thee all our actions by your holy inspirations, and carry them on by your gracious assistance, that every prayer and work of ours may always begin from that may, every prayer and work of ours may begin always from you, and by you be happily ended. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our Lady Seat of Wisdom, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Our Guardian Angels, pray for us. Saint Robert Bellarmine, pray for us. Saint Teresa of Avila, pray for us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. <coughs> Welcome to our Robert Bellarmine um, conference. I uh, we were been working on this for a few weeks now, for several months, but a bit of a delay because you have to have permission from the archdiocese to have any speaker come into uh, any any church facility. So finally, we got all that squared away. And here we are today. So um, I'm glad uh, we've had an opportunity uh, to have Ryan come here. Not only is he going to give an excellent talk on Robert Bellarmine, who many people don't even know about, um, scholarly Jesuit. A saintly man was the spiritual director of Saint Aloysius Gonzaga. If you know anything about him, mm -hmm. uh, he was a Jesuit novish, uh, novice and ended up dying from the plague uh, in Italy at the time and uh, was considered a great saint. And so Robert Bellarmine was his spiritual director. A uh, terrific man, a uh, prolific writer on many subjects, and Ryan will also touch on his work on the papacy. Uh, regarding the role of the papacy, uh, papal um, you know, authority, limits, etc., in light of um, today and certainly the past 50, 60 years confusion about the papacy, uh, at least the, the authority of, of the Pope and where it extends <coughs> and where it stops. And so Ryan uh, will be, he, uh, Ryan is the founder of Mediatrix Press, uh, which was founded up two years ago in 2014. Uh, Ryan uh, is a graduate of Steubenville uh, University, has a bachelor's degree, bachelor's degree? in uh, theology and philosophy, and he lives in Post Falls, Idaho. He's a parishioner at the Fraternity Parish there, St. Joan of Arc in Coeur d'Alene, and, um, and he also is the uh, accredited researcher with the Vatican Apostolic Library. Um, so he has lots of access to all these great sources of material that none of us little uh, lowly people um, are allowed access to so it's uh, a wonderful he has wonderful resources and, uh, and has a great mind very uh, pro uh, pro proficient in Latin also Italian he lived there and was discerning a vocation uh, with the uh, Benedictines in Nursia of course dis uh, discerned that he did not have a vocation he's now married with five children and um, so and also as, as I think of it too before I forget would be appreciated any free will donations that you could give um, would be appreciated to help towards uh, costs and uh, and also this is being recorded so for anyone of you who like to uh, watch it again or to pass it on or to tell people this is all being recorded so uh, we will then post it somewhere on the internet for you to either share or to review again so uh, very glad to welcome Ryan Grant and um, he's here Thank you, Father. All I have to wonder, who is this man you're talking about? <laughs> so as I'm a very uh, lowly soul myself, and so I don't quite have access to the super secret stuff in the Vatican, but nevertheless, um, there, there's a lot of wonderful things there and a lot of wonderful documents that I've been able to look at in this regard. So the... Um, so this talk is going to be on the life of St. Robert Bellarmine and many of his achievements, not the least of which is his sanctity and his holiness. And so the 
uh, then the second talk will deal with the theological writings, some of the content of those writings, specifically in regards to the papacy, the nature of the church. And at the very end of that, we'll discuss, uh, of course, the modern burning question, and especially if you're traditional Catholic, you're very familiar with it, namely the issue of set decantism, what that is. But in the meantime, the first thing we're going to look at is, you know, who is this man that most of us have never heard of, yet is a doctor of the church? He's a patron of catechists. He's the you know, patron of scholars, okay, and he was one of the most scholarly people at the time. He, just, he was on every Vatican congregation later in life when he was a cardinal, and he just, uh, when he would give his opinion, that was enough to shift entire congregations from one way to the other. So much was his learning and his sanctity esteemed by virtually everybody, okay. So the first thing we're going to do is look at uh, Bellarmine's early life, you know, where he came from, what, you know, where where he got his, his learning and his proficiency, and then we'll move for, forward to his life you know, serving the church. So the first thing is that when we hear about saints, you know, who, who are the saints? And when an average secular person hears this word saint, they think of some, you know, plaster figure with a halo on its head, you know, says, you know, their face, if they had a smile, would crack it, you know, they're only straight second nocturne type of people. They only do what, what some pious author has said, and it, it's almost as if they weren't even human. Okay? And the saints weren't like that at all. And so we're going to, and a lot of times when you read a history book that deals in the times in which the saints lived, we get that kind of, uh, you know, they just kind of mention as people, oh, yeah, there's this guy, you know, so and so, you know, even Philip Neary barely skates away with a smile when, when you're going through, when filtering through the secular history. Right, and a good example of this is when you look at the English Reformation, you see St. Thomas More and St. John Fisher. Okay? St. Thomas More is, will always show up in a history book, and his wit and his joviality is always there, partly because he's a layman, he's a lawyer, and he's married, and so there's a sense in which people can identify with him, and he can be secularized. So he can have his place in the story of English, England's national history, but John Fisher does not. He's just ignored most of the time, or gets an honorable mention once in a while. And he was a humanist, an extremely learned man. And actually, St. Robert Bellarmine wrote very much in how, how learned and how much influence St. John Fisher had in his life, especially when he became a bishop, looking at Fisher's <coughs> example. But Fisher, as a man of letters, was the active man fighting Henry in the divorce. But well, we only hear about more, because more can be secularized and Fisher can't. So it's a similar thing with St. Robert Bellarmine. How do you secularize a Jesuit cardinal? Well, you can't, so instead you just kind of put him up as the whipping boy to beat around when you talk about Galileo, which we'll do tonight and dispel some things. So the first thing to look at is Bellarmine's century, which is the 16th century. And what happens in the 16th century? Well, everyone knows, of course, Martin Luther, the 95 Thesis, and, but there's another element to it as well. So you have a unified, undivided Christendom, right, leading up to Robert's birth, which is just in the memory of his birth, just, you know, shattered, but not yet irreparably, right? It's not an irreparable breach yet. It's just a, a new schism and a new heresy to the people in those days, okay? St. Robert Bellarmine was born on October 4th, 1542. So that's the Feast of St. Francis of Assisi, right? And so just about 20 years before that, 21 years in fact, there's something that happens that is, lays the ground for where he comes from. And it all starts with this man. It's unlikely man to figure in this story. This is the Emperor Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, originally the King of Spain. And his descent is really complicated, so we'll just make it a simpler infographic. So he is the grandson, on the one hand, of Isabel and Ferdinand, right, through his mother Juana, also called Juana la Loca, because she had to, would go through fits of dementia and insanity, and as such, she couldn't attain the succession to Spain. So that was going to go to her husband. Philip the Fair. Now Philip was the, <coughs> excuse me, was the Duke of Burgundy. He was also the Lord of Flanders, that's the Netherlands today, Holland and uh, Belgium. And at the same time he was the son of Maximilian I, the Holy Roman Emperor. Okay? And so Charles, a lot of great things are expected of him. So he's educated in the Netherlands. Ferdinand dies in about 1519, leaving Spain then in need of an heir. And so Charles becomes the heir as Carlos Primo, the first, you know, Charles of Spain, right? And so this seems to work well, and this puts him in, cut, in control of all of Spain's resources, which include the New World, right? And all the gold flowing in, and then he says, you know, I could do one better, right? Because being a king of Spain also makes him 
king of Naples, which is all southern Italy, as well as Sicily, and that little island down there, Sardinia. Okay. So then he says, wait, if I can be king of Spain, and I got all this money, well, why not be the Holy Roman Emperor too, through my grandfather? Right? So he takes all the Spanish gold and funds it and makes himself the Lord of what's now Germany. Right? And that time, the idea of Germany, like we think of it today, it doesn't exist. You know, it's a collection of various German states, and the emperor doesn't have a supreme central control. But Charles thinks he's going to change that. While he's away, he comes into conflict with the other major power, which is France. <coughs> and France is not at all happy about being sandwiched between the Habsburgs. Right. So this is the French king, Francois I, and he came to the throne after the death of his father, Louis XII, as a you know, titan, renaissance monarch, centralizes a lot of power and all the disparate nobles behind him to go make war against Charles in Italy. And in the meantime, a little opportunity opened up that he really wasn't expecting, but he was he smiled at and accepting. Now in Spain, nobody really liked the fact that their king is now an absentee monarch. He's overliving in Germany, where he was always more at home anyway. Even though he spoke Spanish fluently, Charles was much more at home in Germany, which is closer to the Flemish he grew up speaking. He, and he likes it better. He's styling himself as this kind of lord of the world almost, trying to get this worldwide empire, except for this pesky French. So the Spanish lords, especially in the Cortez, they don't like the fact that all this gold is flowing out into the empire to go fight the French. And they say, you know, no, we need our king back. We need our money back. Well, you know what? I got an idea. Let's get rid of them and use Juan as a regent until we find a new king. It's a fabulous idea. So they set up the Colmenaroth Revolt, right? So the Lords revolt, and there was one area where they knew they could re uh, do, do a lot of damage, and that was in Never. We'll go back just a minute. Never is about right here. And over here is the, ca the capital of Never, the Spanish Never, the Basque country. It's called Pamplona. And so the Colmenaroths reached out to the Basques, who hated the Spaniards. And they said, well, we'll give you your freedom back. We'll give you your kingdom back if you help us get rid of Charles. So they met at a certain castle called Hadia, and they, they, all the local lords agreed. So they took up arms, and they invited the French to come assist them in this endeavor. So again, Francis, Francois I said, well, I never knew there was such a need to go march into Spain. So he sends his troops along with the Basques, and they make their strike at Pamplona which was the Spanish capital, and it had a very small garrison. So a local lord named Inigo thought that he would, this is the way he would make himself really important for Charles, right, by defending against the, the French in this battle. And he actually, he kept the morale of the troops up very high. He defended it for three days longer than the French thought it could hold out, which was really impressive to them. But in the end, they did breach the walls. And while well, Inigo was fighting very bravely at the breach uh, against the French soldiers, cannon shot the ramparts down, which landed on his leg, crushing it. And after that, the Spanish morale dropped. They surrendered, and the French took possession of Pamplona. But they're so impressed with this Inigo, okay, not this one, <laughs> <laughs> this one, that they let him go back to his ancestral home in Loyola. And thus, you know the rest of the story, right? So St. Ignatius says he, he wouldn't take the name until he came to Italy. So for the moment, Inigo, as he recovered and convalesced in his sickbed, he realized that you know, his, his life isn't going to go the way he planned. He's, now he's crippled. He can never be presentable at court. Right? He, is, you know, he should be perfect and good looking, but if you're limping on a crutch the rest of your life, you're not the ideal knight anymore. And so then in the household, they give him not courtly tales to make him feel better and knights errands and other things, but lives of the saints. Lives of the Saints. You mean there's not a single book on nightly romance? The whole castle? What about Lives of the Saints? What am I going to do with that? So, nevertheless, he starts reading, and what especially impressed him was the life of St. Francis. Right? St. Francis was a knight errant himself. He wanted to be a knight for his local lord, and he spoke all the language in which Francis speaks of, and Lady Poverty, and presenting his sword, his spiritual sword, and his soul, to Lady Poverty, struck in Yigo. And he heard this because this is the language he speaks, the language of a knight. And it really moved him, and also the life of St. Dominic. Both of these two together really moved him. And so he picked up, he left Loyola, and he went to Montserrat. And this is a scene from a recent movie that the Filipino Jesuits made, which actually was extremely good. I was very surprised how good it was. And so what they did, what he does there in Montserrat, is he purges himself, he takes up penances, he goes to confession, he prepares himself for a new life, and he lays his sword before Our Lady of Montserrat. And then he 
goes into solitude, like all the great founders of religious orders do. And while he's there, he composes the spiritual exercises. And that's where really his struggle against the twin temptations of uh, pride and also the belief that despair, that he couldn't be forgiven. He struggled with both of these. First, it was despair. He even became suicidal at one point. And then he committed his will to, to the love of God, that he's, he knows that God can forgive him if he'll be penitent. So he gives himself over to the love of God. And then the, ne the devil, realizing that's not going to work, goes to the next temptation. Oh, you're so pure, you know, it's almost like you never sinned, right? And he avoids this one too. So he tells all the noble ladies that give him alms to distribute to the poor to remind him daily of his sins, lest he would think that, lest he would become puffed up and think that he was pure. So after an aborted attempt to go to the Holy Land and preach, he goes back to study, to take on, the, get the tools he needs to, you know, to, to work for the church, right? Because one of the big problems he runs into is he's preaching without a license. The Franciscans kick him out of the Holy Land. So he gets back into Spain and he goes to Salamanca, where again, he's, he's preaching to the people. Now in those days, it was impossible to have um, itinerant preachers, but what he's completely unaware of is that over in Germany, you have Luther. So in Salamanca, he gets put before the Inquisition, which clears his doctrine in his writings, but then says that he can't preach in Salamanca except to teach children catechism. So after that, they, some, some cardinals in the Inquisition felt that it was an injustice and said, well, why don't you go to Paris? Go to the French who uh, wounded your leg, <laughs> of course. And so he ends up in Paris where he boards with a certain Spanish Basque who had left uh, Pamplona left the, the Basque region to go study in Paris. His older brothers were shooting at Ignatius at uh, Pamplona. And this was <coughs> Francisco Javier, we say St. Francis Xavier. And Xavier, uh, his older brothers had, were big in, in the revolt and brought in the Spanish, and so, or brought in the French against the Spanish. And so he wasn't too pleased about having a Spaniard now in his room, but he made way anyway. And Ignatius had a very winning way with people. He was very warm, he was very approachable, and the love he had for men as well as for God, just really reached down to, to people, even someone like Francis, who was very worldly, wanted to conquer the world, wasn't terribly inclined to take a liking to Spaniards, but eventually he realized that Ignatius was zealous for his soul. And so, especially in 1534, which is the affair of the placards, we'll mention that again later, is when John Calvin comes to Paris and puts up signs all over the city blaspheming the Blessed Sacrament and the saints and other things. And then the people are up in arms. And so the king responds, Francois I, by hanging and executing prominent Calvinists as well as various other criminals. And they start taking a really close eye to the Latin quarter of the Sorbonne. And when they do that, a lot of Francis sees a lot of his former friends now being executed or being put in jail. And he realizes these men were not good men, right? They were, yeah, I thought they were my friends, but they were leading me to hell. But it was Ignatius, who I didn't like, that was really zealous for my soul. And there were numerous others that also followed, um, I could go through the names, but it's not as important at the moment. So it takes too far afield. So there are several Spaniards as well as Frenchmen that gathered around Ignatius that for his purity and teaching, they were inflamed by the life he wanted to live. So they all made their vows. So this depicts the Jesuits making their first vows, private vows, as a congregation of men. The Compagnia de Gesù, that's what they're called in, in Italian, that is the company of Jesus. So this is St. Peter Faber, now St. Peter Faber, who's saying the, saying the Mass as they pronounce their private vows. And this, this is when they decide that their mission is to go to the Holy Land and preach to the infidel. So they make their way down through the wars, continuing wars of Charles V and Francois I that they've left as far as the world goes. But being mostly Spaniards, they're in a lot of trouble because if the French catch them, they could end up getting, uh, getting killed right, as spies. But they managed to make their way to Venice and they can't find any pilgrim ships. So then Ignatius remembers how he got booted out of the Holy Land by the Franciscans because they, since the time of the Crusades, had full authority over all ecclesiastical matters in the Holy Land. So he said, you know, we need papal permission. Let's go to Rome. And so when he gets there, Pope Paul III is very impressed. Now, Pope Paul III, the, the dreaded Cardinal Farinese, he's very reform-minded, but he's not, not in his own personal reformation. Right? So he's lived a very high life as a Cardinal, patronized the art. It was he, for example, that patronized Giorgio Vasari to write the, the Lives of the Artists, the Vita degli Artisti, which is the, what we now have as a primary source for, or somewhat primary source for Lyle, <coughs> Raphael, Michelangelo, and many others. But um, he wasn't, he, he'd had uh, biological children by a mistress as a Cardinal, 
And many of these he had made cardinals, because nepotism is a very evil feature of the papacy in those days, which uh, was not at all to its credit in those times. Ferenese sees these guys as all the humanists in Europe following you know, the line of people like Erasmus and others are questioning whether the papacy is a human office or a divine one. And then you have Luther and his disciples calling the Pope the Antichrist. He's not really you know, a bishop at all. He's, he's the man of sin, the, the beast in the apocalypse that, that's presiding over the church, right? So then you know, here are some guys with vows to obey the Supreme Pontiff. Wow, this is fantastic. Stay a while, please. Um, you won't make it to the Holy Land. Forget all about that. Because I just signed a deal with Charles V in Venice, and we're going to attack the Turks. And because we're attacking the Turks, you're never, ever going to find a pilgrim ship that will take you there. So why don't you stay here? Preach. So he gives orders to all the rest that weren't ordained, including Ignatius himself. And so at this point, he begins to be called Ignatius. And then Pope Paul V approves his, con Pope Paul III, I'm sorry, approves his constitutions approves the whole rule and order of the Society of Jesus, and they begin preaching throughout Italy. And there's such a reformation as has never been seen. Rome was right for it. In 1527, there was a famous sack of Rome by Charles V's soldiery. The payment went into arrears because he couldn't get all the money he needed. So this, the army mutinied and decided to go take on Rome. And so they sacked the city. It was a very terrible sack, plenty. So this is kind of, in Rome to the point, it had been very pagan, right? Very um, artistically pagan, drunk up with the Renaissance and the arts to the exclusion of the gospel. Priests didn't preach, bishops didn't preach, nobody did what they were supposed to be doing. And so the, uh, the paganism of the Renaissance perishes in the 1527 fire. People are now in a renewed spirit to serve the gospel and to preach the gospel and to reform the church. And then right in time come the Jesuits, 1534. And this is the thing that really sets off the reform of, of Rome and prepares it to be the center of the Counter-Reformation, without which it might not have had that particular direction. The spiritual exercises float around freely around Rome. Uh, St. Philip Neri, for example, was very influenced by it. It's one of the things that made his decision to become a priest. Uh, St. Charles Borromeo was a lay cardinal all right, before he became the great reforming cardinal of Milan. And you know he was did what he was supposed to do, right? Is you know getting all these benefices and churches under him that he was the protector of to get the money, right? And so that his family, when when they said, "All right, now's the time for you to go marry this person, resign the cardinal, and keep all that money with you," of course. And you know as he's living this life, he does the spiritual exercises, and he realizes what he's missing, right? To to pile up riches for this world instead of for the next. So he immediately starts distributing his alms to the poor. He resigns as many commissions as he can. And then his family goes to the Pope at the time. There's Pope Paul the Pope Pius IV. So this is a problem. Hey, we got our, our friend here, our, our, our nephew. We got to do something before he gets too crazy. In the meantime, Borromeo found a bishop to ordain him. So now there is no going back. He could never be put, he sent to get married and keep on the family line and all that other stuff. And he eventually became the great holy reforming bishop of Milan and was subsequently canonized. And there were many others influenced in the same way. So for the moment, we're going to look at this fellow. So Pasquez Broé is also one of the first Jesuits. And he was a French secular priest and he'd want, he was impressed by Ignatius in Paris. And so when he saw the order founded in Rome, he decided that's where I want to be. So he left Paris and made his journey to Rome and served the Pope. He actually became a missionary for the Pope in Ireland, which, because uh, this is following the break with Henry VIII, he had one, they wanted a state of the church in Ireland, so he had to flee Henry VIII's uh, you know, soldiers and ended up his way into Edinburgh, of all places in Scotland, and finally makes his way back to Rome. So then he pronounces his vows into St. Ignatius of Loyola's hands and it becomes the, cardinal, or the confessor to Cardinal Cervini. Right. Now, Cardinal Cervini would become one of the most important uh, men in the church. He's a big reformer, big on ecclesiastical reform, hates nepotism and all the evil abuses of the Middle Ages, but all of his might. And he's also trying to work, doing the groundwork to found the Council of Trent. And so on his way to Trent, he takes Broe with him back to his home, his, his home city, Monte Porciano, which you might recognize the name at the very least from various wine bottles. It's now, it's mostly known today for producing wine as opposed to two popes, four canonized saints, and numerous cardinals. It's a very small city in the Italian hillside. And if you get off, if you're in Italy and you get on a train to go to Monte Pulciano, it's one of those places where there is a train stop that says Monte Pulciano, and you'll step out, and there's a sign, and there's fields. There's not really much there. And then you look up 
three or four miles away. Oh, that's Bantu Pochiana. Whoops, it's, it's going to be a couple of hours before we get there now. And the best way to get there is from, Par uh, from Siena, if you take the road down into Bantu Pochiano. Anyway, so Cardinal Cherubini gets there and he introduces Pasquez Brue to his sister, Cinzia, who is married to Vincenzo Palmino, and he meets a very young four-year-old Roberto Palmino, okay, or St. Robert Bellarmine. Brue made a very powerful impression on St. Robert Bellarmine's mother, Cinzia, or Cynthia, and she, as you formed in her heart at that time, because the Jesuits now remember are an entirely unknown order outside various quarters in Rome. And they don't even have that name yet. The word Jesuit or Jesuitical, Latin Jesuite, means someone that uh, used to mean somebody who abused the holy name in his sermons. That is, that he would, to cover up the lack of erudition and the lack of preparation and planning in his sermons, he's repeatedly appealing to the name of Jesus to cover up that he really has no content to give you. That's what being Jesuitica, being Jesuitical meant in those times. But somehow the name stuck because they were the Compagnia de Jesu. They got rendered Latin, Societas Jesu, Society of Jesus, and that's how it is today. So Bellarmine then, and it is in his family, they've never heard of the Jesuits until this moment where Brue comes in with Cardinal Cherubini. And they actually distinguish themselves with the Council of Trent, which is how they started to become more known, because various theologians there would preach, and they, who, who, what order are those guys from? Those are so smart guys, right? Even bishops coming in and other things to Trent would hear these men preach and say, wow, these are impressive people. So this is uh, Bellarmine's house, and it was in this courtyard that Brue uh, prepared a spiritual discourse for the whole family, even though he also had a fever and a, and, a, and a terrible headache. And this impressed absolutely everybody. And so some dignitaries of the town were present decided, we should have a Jesuit college here. And it took a number of years for that to happen. Okay. So in the meantime, St. Robert grew up, and he was sent through the same uh, Ratio Studiorum, the same plan of studies that everyone would in those days, which is based on the medieval, uh, medieval triduum, which was logic, rhetoric, grammar. The grammar came first, and that was Latin grammar. Okay, so you had to learn Latin, because it didn't matter if you were Protestant, or you were Catholic, or what, and they, all the way until about the 18th century, eloquentia Latina was the most important thing. And if you were fluent in Latin, you were educated. If you were not, you were not educated. And that's how it was taken in those days, because there were no advanced studies in the vernacular. There were no means by which people could acquire knowledge and be accounted educated unless they had gone through the, the plan of learning Latin then logic, right? And so Latin grammar lends itself to this because it's more, much more logical language in many respects than, than say ancient Greek, which is a very beautiful language and a very amazing language, but is, is very complicated. And the Latin is a lot more simple in that regard. Then it, uh, so you learn logic, how to argue correctly. And then you are, learn rhetoric, which is the golden line. That's the, you know, usually Ciceronian rhetoric. How to speak well. So it's one thing to learn how to argue correctly, but if you're darn boring, nobody wants to listen to you. So rhetoric, how to not just argue correctly, but argue well. So Bellarmine learns all these things in the local uh, town, right, in Montepulciano, they had a, a grammar school there. Now, in the meantime, his father, Vincenzo, makes some money, but not a whole lot. And they're a very poor family, yet his mother, has a, it, Bellarmine says in his autobiography, has a love, of, almost a mania for almsgiving, which would find its way into Bellarmine as well later in life. So she would constantly give alms, even though her family could definitely use some. Okay, so, but he was raised with a constant life. He says in his autobiography that his mother kept them away from the rougher crowd in the town. Okay, so you're not. So if you look at St. Robert's upbringing, you're not being evil for keeping your, your children away from uh, less savory elements. And then he was uh, constantly brought to mass. Learned how to serve mass. Actually, mass in those times too would very only slightly from the 1962 Missal we see today, would have been some, because in those areas, you, they said the Roman Rite, even those before St. Pius V and Quo Primo, right? So they, um, so they learned to serve Mass, they learned the, their usual devotions, and St. Robert Bellarmine was seen already to have a keen intellect, very, very wise, very intelligent, even showed an inclination toward med the medical industry, toward being a doctor, which in those days would be very lucrative, because especially if you were an excellent doctor, because there's a lot of uh, what they used to call in the 1920s quacks, and quacks meant people who weren't particularly learned, but knew like one or two procedures well, just did those all the time. And you see that, of course, today with your practitioners that say, well, let's see, what, uh, what, what drug is this month? Okay, here, everyone gets this one, right? People who don't really understand that your, your medical conditions, but we have our fix-all, right? 
So if you could become an excellent doctor, you could you know, be very wealthy, and that would help the family. And that's what Vincenzo's thinking. When Robert Bellman was 14, his uncle, Cardinal Cherubini, we mentioned earlier, Marcello, he becomes Pope Marcellus II. Okay? So Marcellus II is also the Pope Papa Menicelli that uh, Palestrina wrote his famous uh, mass for. And he was a reforming cardinal, and he, again, like we said, he hates abuses, nepotism, and all these problems. So he comes, and everyone in Montepulciano is wild, right? Especially any, uh, any of his family that were in clerics who started putting on silk, thinking, woohoo, we're getting our, our promotion any minute now. And then he wrote to all his relatives saying, don't you dare come into Rome on pain of excommunication. There will be no nepotism, right? Trying to dash all their hopes. Nobody's going to benefit. We're going to reform the church. And then he dies in 30 days. Much uh, it's one of those those questions of divine providence, you know, what's God setting up here? Because here seems like this perfect guy to reform the church. And, in, and of course, the Council of Trent had been stopped, by the way, in this time period. 1546, it was suspended from Trent and brought to Bologna. And prior to the agreement with Charles V was that they, because this was a German problem they're trying to address, namely Luther, the council would be held in German lands. In Trent, today it's in northern Italy, but in those times that was imperial territory, so it was in German lands. And so the Pope was really uncomfortable about this because Paul III was present during the aforesaid sack of Rome. And he saw what the German troops did. He feared what happens if Charles is all-powerful. So he was very nervous about Charles's power. So he says, no, let's just recall it to Bologna. And Bologna was an excellent city for a council, but it wasn't in German lands. So Marcellus comes and he has this whole idea, we're going to start Trent again. We're really going to reform all these issues in the church. And as we mentioned, he dies. This made a very powerful impression on St. Robert Bellarmine, namely that his uncle hits the height of power on earth. In 30 days, he was dead. He was all gone. What's the point? And so as he grows older and more pious and a little bit more learned, his Latin becomes exceptional. He starts writing poetry. He says in his autobiography that he was lost to Latin poetry, especially to Virgil, right? the Roman poet Virgil in the Aeneid, which if you have never read it, especially in Latin, um, it's, it can be really engrossing and really consume your time. Right? And, and for good reasons, too. It really opens the mind of the horizons of thought and the way in which you know, Virgil uses his words. So Bellarmine started composing his own poetry using only the vocabulary found in Virgil. Okay. And so he has, uh, starts to conceive of church life, going into religious life. And the thing that happens that spurs this on is that the Jesuits finally come to town. Right? So they open up a college. It immediately creates problems because the Jesuits charge no fees. So you can think of the, what the other schoolmasters say, hey, you guys are, are opening up a free school. We have to pay bills here. And it created a large problem. The Jesuits eventually did have to leave about 20 years after that. But nevertheless, in the meantime, Vincenzo Bellamino transfers all his sons over to the Jesuits. And so they, they perfect St. Robert's Latinity. They also perfect his, his love of philosophy and theology, although Bellamino had never had a love of philosophy in and of itself. It was rather for the sake of the faith, right, as the handmaiden of theology. So the idea of arguing over questions of Aristotle, just because if you're really bored him to death, you wanted nothing to do with it. Because theology is worth the battle is being fought. So then he decides he wants to become a Jesuit. And his uncle, Pope Marcellus, loved the Jesuits, promoted them very heavily, helped uh, enlarge the Roman college where the Jesuits had their university in Rome. So Bellarmine, you know, started feeling that way. Right? Because and he says in his autobiography, I started looking, right, inspired again by his uncle's early demise. I started looking for that one place where I could go where I was surest to be free from ever being offered ecclesiastical dignities. And then I found that the Jesuits, because they take vows never to accept ecclesiastical dignities, such as cardinal or pope, that this is the place where I can go and I can be spared being elevated to some earthly honor, where there's only one honor, and that's the glory of heaven. So then his father, on the other hand, says, wait a minute, we put all our hopes on you. You're the smartest one we've got, and it'll lift us out of poverty. So he says no. And then he trains and orders his son, Robert, never to go to the Jesuits again. If you want to go to, to, to Mass and the confession, you know, there's Dominicans in the town. Hey, it'd be great to be a Dominican. You know, they, they've had cardinals, and there have been Dominican popes, and this would be a wonderful thing for you. And, you know, because his father's still thinking. His father wasn't a bad man, but he was thinking in terms of worldly glory. And, you know, you know necessarily, if your father family as I am, you are worried about how you're paying bills and feeding kids. And so this becomes a, you know, hey, this will at least get us on a sure footing. So then uh, eventually, so Robert obeys, but he's still not really conforming. 
So he, because he, he's set, this is what I want to do. And this is also what his mother wants him to do. So his mother, Cynthia, had also made pilgrimages to Loretto, where the Jesuits may actually manage Loretto itself, just to go to confession to their fathers, because they were known to be reformed priests. You're right, and that was one thing that the Jesuits, even as they expanded in the beginning, did not lose the spirit of their rule in poverty. So eventually, his father sees the strain that this is putting on his wife, and Vincenzo lets up and gives him his permission. And then in, uh, after a year in discernment, he writes to Diego Leñez. So this is a portrait of Diego Leñez. He's one of the first uh, followers of St. Saint, Saint Ignatius. And he's the superior general at the time, 1560, when St. Robert Bellarmine enters into the Jesuits. So this is a picture of the Roman college, as it was in those days, and the, the original Gregorian University. And so Bellarmine entered there, was first given uh, two weeks to, to pray and do, do a small retreat, and then was sent to prove his mettle with the pots and pans in the kitchen. All right? And so he did this for, for several weeks. It was hard work in those days, because you think of nice things we have now. Not just dishwashers, but dish soaps that cut the grease, right? And things like, you didn't have those in those days. You had elbow grease for cutting grease. And so it's a lot of hard and miserable work. And finally, of course, you don't have disposable sponges. You don't have, you have rags, and you would yourself have to clean out the rags. So it's a lot of heavy work that falls upon his shoulders. But nevertheless, he finishes this, this gruesome work, and then is finally sent to begin his studies. Right, which begin a philosophy. Now, it uh, follows the medieval plan of study in university. So first you take your, your, your doctorate in philosophy, and then you get it in theology. And the concept of the doctor is a little bit different from ours, because we have our system, you get a bachelor's degree, then you get a master's degree, then you get a, you know, depending on what kind of discipline you're in, you might get a license or a licentiate, and like in theology you get one of those. Then finally you get a doctorate. Right, and so that takes you know takes a lot of time, takes a lot of money. In those days, it was kind of a big package. Right. Let's see if we can fix that. So it was, a, it was a more of a package deal. After so many years, boom, you get your doctorate, and they had the right from Pope Paul IV to um, it was Pius IV. I think it was Pius IV to confer their own doctorates. So you start off with Aristotle. Aristotle for everything. The Jesuits had become infatuated from the very beginning, in the way, just in, as in Paris with the study of Aristotle for all your basic um, issues. And this will come back when we talk about Galileo. We'll talk about that particular issue. So it starts off, of course, logic with Aristotle. Metaphysics, which is the queen of all philosophy, is one of the most important. Because metaphysics is essentially the study of being, what we are, what makes existence. And then there's other issues in ethics. And you had to know these extremely well. Okay? So after three years, St. Robert Bellarmine's health gets really bad. And they decide, well, you know what we need is we need to send him to, to his native heir. Right, so they send him back to Tuscany, where in the, which is the relative region where Montepulciano is and is from. So first they send him to the fathers in Florence. And this is interesting because when he's there, they say, oh wait, you speak Latin really well. You know, why don't you preach? And he's like, you know, I can't preach. I'm not even tonsured yet. And they say, get out there and preach under obedience. And so he's ordered by his superiors to go begin preaching to the, you know, he could go out with another Jesuit father who was uh, ordained. He would preach on various things in the gospel to the country folk, and then the priest would hear the confessions that would result from it. And at this time, he's only about 22 when he's uh, you know, preaching already, and as he says in his autobiography, beardless. And it was one of those abuses you could get away with in Italy in those times, namely that you weren't yet tonsured, but as long as you had a license <clears throat> from your superiors, you could preach, regardless of um, you know, what, what we look at it now is where Trent has been fully implemented world for quite some time, and so now you can't actually preach unless you're at least in the order of a deacon. And that's the way it used to work at a certain point, and then they kind of let that go. To the point where Bellarmine even was put in the, the great uh, cathedral of Florence, the Dolmo, and he preached from the very same pulpits that Savonarola had preached from about 50 years earlier, okay, 50, 60 years earlier. So now it, it gets this huge reputation as a preacher, and also as a teacher, they send him to teach in various schools, and they're so impressed with him, they, they say, all right, what we need you to do is go down, go north, go into Piedmont. And we want you to run the school there. So, and then again, you know, obedience. And so then when they send him, so now Tuscany, should put a map up here, but Tuscany is a relative um, central Italy, roughly. And then, so to get to Mandavi, which is in Piedmont, you have to go up several mountain ranges to deal with. Usually you go from the sea to Genoa, and then you get to Piedmont, which is just outside the peninsula in the boot, and just getting closer to southern France. 
So he's sent out there on foot by himself. So on the way, he has a number of dangers, and on top of that, they only give him a little bit of money, not nearly sufficient for his his uh, needs. And of course, that's part of the game, is those who professed poverty need to be ready to feel its pinch, rather than have everything provided for them. But he is, relates in his autobiography, he goes through various travails on the way, of course, storms that, that uh, almost drowned him. In one town he stopped in, he was mistaken for the long-absent husband of the innkeeper's daughter, and, and then uh, this almost turned out really bad for him until somebody spoke up and said, no, 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 he's, he's a priest, look at him. And of course he wasn't, but he was religious, right, because he had a religious garb. Then, uh, and it was these other things, and so he conceived the idea then that if he's ever in a position of authority in the society, he's always going to make sure at the very least that they don't travel alone, unless they have to deal with all kinds of issues of this sort. It ends in innkeepers, you can tell from this experience that Bellarmine actually maintains a dislike and distrust of them. As he relates in a number of his sermons, in the Louvain sermons, he features innkeepers in various humorous uh, manners that are not to their credit uh, a number of different times. So you can tell he didn't like it. So he arrives in Mandavi, which is in Piedmont, right? and at this time he's about 23 or so, going on 24. And he's supposed to run the school as half the staff that he was told it would. And on top of that, he's, you know, he was ordered by the provincial in Piedmont to teach Greek from Demosthenes. And then he responded, why, I don't know Greek, except for the alphabet. Otherwise, I, I really don't know it. And they said, well, you'll manage. <laughs> so he does. Barely. So he starts his, uh, his teaching, and the first two weeks, then he tells them, okay, we're going to review the rudiments of, of Greek, and then, you know, then we'll get really into Demosthenes, his famous uh, orator in, in ancient times. So first he starts off with every, you know, the lesson of the day. Then at night, after all his other duties, Rob is asleep for a few hours to, to study forward and, and <laughs> learn ahead the lessons that he's going to have to teach in the future. But then at the end of two weeks, he was learned enough to start lecturing on Demosthenes himself. If he managed to teach himself a sufficient amount of the, the language. Because he was a first-rate genius, but the other thing is his memory. And the way he worked it, and actually Demosthenes comes into this. Demosthenes, in his, his books and rhetoric, handed down a method of, of learning and memorizing, which is that the orator should conceive of a great room. And in those days, they describe it in ancient terms. So a room with jars on the scenes and the foca, where the household gods were kept in a pagan house and such things, and so that you would imagine your first point, your prayer oratio, goes in that first uh, jar, and then the next point up to the supreme point, which is where the household gods are. So this hand was system was passed down to Cicero by Apollonius Mola, and he, so he gave that, and Cicero used that to become the greatest order in Rome, that system of remembering. Because other people, if you're, you're bungling off notes all the time, then you don't become an effective speaker. Right, and so Cicero knew this, and this passes on to the Middle Ages. So St. Thomas Aquinas used this very same system, except instead of a house with household gods, it's a great cathedral. And imagine the side altar is where your first point goes. And then the next side altar, and then finally you get to the high altar, where the, the summum, the highest point goes. And that's how all you know, speeches be memorized. So using that, he also used that for reading. So St. Thomas was said to be able to memorize about 95% of the book once he'd read it which is essential in those days with no Kindle, no Google, no, uh, no smartphones, no, um, even no paper. Paper wasn't invented until like the 1300s, everything was vellum, shit, uh, calfskin. And all books were handwritten, she didn't have printing yet. For so St. Thomas, that's an essential skill to memorize the majority of what you've read. And so St. Robert Bellarmine is in this tradition also, memorizing the majority of what he read. He used to say that he could remember a sermon of an hour's length, uh, or not an hour's length, he could memorize a lengthy Latin sermon in the length of an hour. Right, he could memorize the entire thing so that he could preach it from memory, wow. which is an impressive thing. He also talks a little bit about, in some letters, about his method of teaching. Because, of course, he's a short Italian. He's only, if you've ever seen his body, which is not San Ignacio, we'll show it at the end. But he's, you know, only about this tall. And so he doesn't have a beard. And he comes into this class to teach a lot of unruly boys, many of whom are taller than he is. But yet, and the educational theory at the time was, that to get the children in submission, you have to beat them a little bit, right? You have to beat them around. And there's a story, for example, in like Tudor education, which is almost contemporaneous in England, that the uh, schoolmaster for boys who hadn't learned their lessons right or what have you, they hoist them up in the middle of the room, expose the bare back, and then they take all the other boys that have their turn with broomsticks going at it on, on the poor kid's back. So that now you will learn to learn your lessons, right? And that's how, because the, their theory of education was if you didn't beat the boys, they would just kind of waste their time. Right? And so this is how, you know, this is the Bellarmine looks at this as what not to do. And, you know, and all the schoolmasters that age were addicted to it, even very great ones. So Bellarmine actually says himself that he never had to resort to a beating. 
he never had to resort to any, any kind of violence against a boy. And usually just the look of his own displeasure was enough to get them kind of back in line because it was evident to the boys that he loved them and that they should give him that in return. So they fell in line. So part of it is, too, that Bellarmine, no matter what, no matter how holy he became, always had this very winning manner, always very charitable and loving, very urbane, very happy and joyful, even when he's preparing for death, and that's the principal thing in his mind later in life. He's taken from uh, <coughs> Mandove and goes from Padua. That's the great basilica of St. Anthony of Padua. Uh, if you want to go get ready, for, uh, prepare for a walk, it's from the train station in several miles which I didn't know when I, when I went to it many years ago and I had a suitcase and I said to the man, you know, uh, and he looks at me, he looks at my suitcase, and he says, Impiede? Because <laughs> the guy had no idea, but it was several miles away. So yes, I'm going on foot. Bellman preached in Padua for a number of years too and also began to run schools. He became a, a great fixture in the educational establish, establishments in Padua, which have a long tradition for hundreds of years of great centers of learning and also the Renaissance. Now, Padua was actually formerly under Venetian territory at that time. And so Bellarmine was in Venice a few times to preach, especially against carnival. And we think of carnivals as these fun little things, and they roll into town, and you waste your money on these foolish rides and, and uh, bad sweets that your kids probably don't need. And then um, the carnival in those days were a much more serious affair. So the word itself, carni vale, means to meet, carni vale, farewell because they would, that's why it would take place right before Lent, because in Lent in those days, under the more ancient discipline, you didn't eat meat, not a single day, for the entirety of Lent, right? Whereas that got, you know, it gets retracted today. Even in the 1917 canon law, that was the case. In the current canon law, it's just, um, uh, it's, it's not required at all, in fact, come to think of it, except on Friday, and on Fridays, that's right. Um, I always forget, so many disciplines and exceptions to the discipline, you lose track of which one's holding in which country. But, so, so back in those days, no meat, all went. So you had your farewell to meat, this great sumptuous festival of all the, the, the meat you could procure. And that gets a little bigger as the ages go. So now it's dancing, dancing into the night, as St. Alphonsus Liguori calls it. There's uh, all kinds of sin and debauchery involved with it. Right? And that's why the uh, first Sunday of Lent used to be called Brand Sunday, because those who had been particularly obnoxious and notorious sinners during Carnival used to have to carry a brand in church while wearing sackcloth because they were going to now do public penance for the whole of Lent. Right? And that's how, so Bellamy goes to Venice to preach against Carnival, and a lot of the, the nobility of the city are present, and they're so moved by it, they actually close down some of the more exuberant and ridiculous things in Carnival and actually bring everyone home earlier, they discontinue the dancing, all the rauchous dancing. You know, when they talk about dancing, too, it's not because dancing in and of itself is evil, it's because this particular form of dancing, unguarded, unchaperoned, between men and young men and women, is very dangerous for the Sixth and Ninth Commandment, and that's the gist of Bellarmine's uh, sermon on the subject. He uses a similar thing when he's in Louvain on a similar theme. For, so for Quinquages and the Sunday, which in the old calendar is just before Lent, then he, it's actually called Contra Bacchanalia. And Bacchanalia is a Roman term for the great feast of the god Bacchus, the god of wine. And in medieval Latin, it refers to a great big party, carnival, drunkenness, and other kinds of uh, affairs, especially were popular in the Netherlands. That's why he preaches it there. But, so he becomes a very, so famous as a preacher that word of him reaches all around Europe, especially up in Louvain. Now, Louvain is in Belgium, which in those days was called Flanders, and it was the last Catholic outpost kind of in Northern Europe between England and Germany and, of course, Holland, where the, the Dutch Revolution against the Spanish was already in full gear and the Eighty Years' War was now, you know, continuing to the misery of everybody, except possibly Duke of Alba, who really enjoyed it. So, the, uh, which is not a good thing. Louvain was a really famous center of reform starting in the four, uh, 1400s, and Erasmus of Rotterdam went there, actually. Of course, he had a very different notion of reform. He was a noted humanist, and his idea was in some ways similar to Luther's to the point where Luther, both Luther and Calvin claim Erasmus for credit, even though Erasmus hated both of them and had no mind for schism. But his idea of reform of the church was the, just a simple gospel. Just take us simply back to the Bible. Forget about all these accretions over the ages. You know, reduce the mass to its simplest form. Maybe you've heard some of this stuff before and uh, reduce the churches and all this splendor and just worry about this very simple life. Now, this kicked off a reaction to Louvain, not in favor of abuses, but rather reform abuses without eviscerating the very nature of the church. And that's where uh, you have various figures that prepare the ground for reform so that when Bellarmine arrives here, right, it's, it's a very different place. 
than a lot of the other universities in Europe. It's very reform-minded. A lot of theological issues have really been thought out very clearly, especially free will and grace and other, other issues that Erasmus used to argue on, and that now Luther and Calvin, their doctrines and their adherents are arguing as well. So in Louvain, what they had was they preached in Latin in several churches because it was a, it was a multilingual area. Because you have a confluence of English and Dutch and Germans and Norse, as well as Spanish, French, you have the native languages of Flemish and uh, Walloon. In, um, actually, Walloon speak a dialect of French, really, but it's still somewhat distinct. And then also the Dutch and Italians. You know, they're all this big confluence. And so if you're a merchant or you're doing any business in Louvain, you need to know either all these languages or you need to know enough Latin to work with different people. And so they would all learn just a su sufficient Latin where they could converse, and everyone doing business in Louvain knew they could converse in Latin. So preaching wasn't just for the students, they also needed to preach to this multilingual community for which they couldn't provide preachers in all those languages. So they preached in Latin. And the priest who had preached the Latin sermons retired from illness, and they needed a new one. They heard about this fellow in Italy, Nate Bellarmine, who was brilliant in Latin. Why don't we get him up here? And so that eventually the Jesuit superiors agree to it. So then, of course, without some reluctance on the part of Padua and other places. So they send him up to Louvain. It was a long, long trip. He actually goes with very famous figures like Cardinal Allen, who was the founder of the college at Dewey, which produced the Dewey Reeves Bible and others. So Bellarmine then gets to Louvain and he says to them, to the father, Jesuit fathers there, I've been sent to you for two years, but I will be here for seven. And sure enough, it was exactly seven years that he was there. And this is the first instance of what happens for much of his life. He has a gift of prophecy that he, he never acknowledges. He just says, oh, no, it just came to my head. But he clearly has dates and by other testimony besides his own. He clearly has you know, the date exactly right where he gets some light of what's going to happen. So he knows he's going to be there for seven years, even though it was only two. And what happens then is they say, wait, he's not in orders yet. What's going on here, you Italians? You've got this guy preaching and he's not in orders. We can't have that. So the, the fathers of Louvain at the university demand that if he's going to preach here, then teaching needs to be in orders. So they put through to the Jesuit superior, superior at the time, which was St. Francis Borgia, who's also the grandson of Alexander, Pope Alexander VI, right? It's proof that uh, even the worst things can have good results in the end somehow uh, with God's providence directing it. So St. Francis Borgia then hears about this and then he says, all right, well, you know, make him take the vows and then be, they let him be ordained. So then in one day, one Sunday, he received all the orders up to subdiaconate. And then on uh, Holy Saturday, actually, uh, just after the Easter vigil, because in those days it was done in the morning, right? Actually, as it continued to be until the time of Pius XII. The, um, that was done, and then he went through ordination from diaconate to priesthood, right? It was ordained by Cornelius Jansen, who's the uh, grand uncle of the founder of the Jansenist heresy, although Cornelius Jansen was actually an Orthodox bishop, so we don't want to confuse the two. <clears throat> but, um, so then he, at last he was a priest, and that also happened to be the Annunciation. So the Feast of the Annunciation was always on his mind, and he preached, I think, no less than 25 sermons on that subject during his life. So it was, a, it was a, definitely his most favorite feast, that you know, being his ordination. So his first year he preached, and this is a pulpit in Louvain, but this is not the pulpit, because that was in the Church of St. Michael's, which was destroyed during the War of Spanish Succession. So that, that particular pulpit that Bellarmine preached out of is no longer there. But in those days, see, we're kind of used to, especially since uh, the Second Vatican Council, the idea is, oh, we've got to be simpler. We've got to take things down. I'll have some commentary on that later. But what they do is all these magnificent pulpits, which have medieval traditions as well as Baroque traditions, they start taking out. Oh, that's too grand. The priest can't be up there. He's got to be down here like everyone else. And so we're not used to a priest rising up to a pulpit. And if you see some churches in Europe, you have a similar thing where, because uh, usually the priest who said mass did not also preach, not at the same mass, except in mission territory. Yeah, and that's how it used to work. So you'll go to some churches in Europe, particularly in Spain, and you'll, you'll see that you have a magnificent altar or anything, and there's a pulpit, and then you'll sit there, well, where's the priest preach from? And then kind of up in the middle of the church, there's a door, okay, and, and a balcony. And the priest would be basically waiting. And I remember when I, before I knew any of this, when I just kind of saw it, and I didn't know much about the liturgy of the tradition, I wondered, how did the priest get away from there to up there in any kind of timely manner? Well, it wasn't the priest. So he, it, was, it was a different one. He's waiting, and as soon as the, the gospel ends and the, the, the presiding priest sits down, he would come out from the, and start preaching, ran a surplus and a stole, and that's how they used to do it in those days. So uh, Bellarmine, 
um, but also, you know, in this case, it was a, this particular pulpit, so he'd be waiting for just a little bit of time, then the gospel would end, and he'd go up and start preaching. Now, he has this one problem that he's very short, so he actually relates in uh, his autobiography one occasion, because the Jesuit house was a bit away from the Church of St. Michael, so he had to walk some distance in order to get there, and as he was walking, he, he encountered a man who said, hey, you know, have you heard about this uh, Jesuit father from Italy? Because he didn't recognize him by sight. And he, as he explains, because he looked completely different on, on the ground than he did in the pulpit. And then so Bellman just kind of gives answers without any definite information. And then the guy says, well, I gotta hurry, I gotta hurry along to, uh, to make sure I find a place. So I hope you can get in there. And then he says, oh, don't worry, I won't fail to find a place. Right, so he eventually did, and then gets in, got up to the pulpit. When he gets to the pulpit, he do, does something to deal with his short stature, is that he brought a stool with him. So he put the stool up, and then he seemed to be a giant in the pulpit. But on the ground, he was just kind of almost a completely different man, just kind of short. <laughs> How did that happen? But, you know, so, but from the pulpit, he would then preach and explain very simply without any complicated devices. A lot of preachers would get really drunk on rhetoric in those times. And so you would love to stick in classical devices, you like a lot of complicated issues in rhetoric, and especially in Latin, where most of the people are just grasping, and apart from the students who should be expected to know it, a lot of the people are just grasping what they're hearing. Right? And if you ever get a basic fluency in a foreign language and you're listening to it and you're straining, you pretty much got it, but you don't have it all. If somebody tries some major rhetorical device, it really gets you messed up. So Bellarmine, because he's not just for the students, but also for the, the people, He's giving a sermon that you know would just cover the basics of the gospel without using all these complicated devices. But the language is still witty. It's funny. It's amusing. There's uh, two collections of his sermons. One is in the, com uh, the complete works, and they're all in Latin, and there's the ones he preached in Louvain. But then there's another one that was discovered, actually, in the 20th century by a Dutch Jesuit named Sebastian Trump, right, when he was in Rome. He finds his manuscripts and was able to verify these rebellions are all in his hand. And so those are published, although extremely difficult to find, as uh, opera oratoria postuma, posthumous uh, sermons, basically. And so there's about nine volumes of those. They're very massive. Probably about next week, I should be coming out with Bellarmine's autobiography and add it as a sermon taken from that, that particular work. So I, I was meant to have it for, for today, and I wasn't able to get it done in time. But anyway, so the sermons use different devices of common everyday life, right, where he addresses the issues that, of course, like I mentioned, he brings in innkeepers in a very witty and amusing manner. But then he also talks about uh, issues of sloth and laziness and drunkenness. So he gives a sermon on the gospel for the first Sunday of Advent, where Saint, on the epistle, I'm sorry, where St. Paul says that, um, you know, now, you know, uh, our, our time is nearer than the hour when we first believed. And he talks about being vigilant, being prepared. And he said, now there's some class of men who are rather like the type that will sleep on it. Will they sleep? They'll sleep until about noon. And still they won't rouse until finally you come very close to them and shout in a loud voice, wake up, it's time for a very great business, namely lunch. And he continues on these, on these veins to deal with the, 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 our, our nature, right? To, to kind of be lazy, to forget what we're supposed to be doing. And so he talks about, first he'll go on, and of course the Lutherans, what are they doing? You know, they're, they're not, they're walking away from the approaching hour of the Lord's coming, right, by their, by their heresy. But what about us Catholics? And he always focuses back, so it's not even just a, well, yeah, those heretics out there, they're they bad, right? And it's really just a device to show how much worse Catholics are who don't live the faith. So he lays this out, and then he says, well, what about Catholics who, they have all the tools in front of them, but they don't go to Mass, and they don't pray the Rosary, and they don't engage in the life they should engage in. They're worried about their affairs in this world. These people, he says, are walking backwards. Like a of a crab, you know, walking backwards, away from the hour of the Lord's coming. So he has a number of other sermons. I already mentioned his one against the, the Bacchanalia for uh, Quinquagesima. You can find some of these in English. Um, the one I mentioned, actually, I translated. I think I have it on the internet somewhere. Um, you can find some of his sermons in a book called Sermons from the Latins, which are sermons from Bellarmine and also another Jesuit father, Father Signieri. And... Um, yeah, it's out of print, but you can find it on archive.org and other places. So they have a lot of, at least, sections of Bellarmine sermons for epistle and gospel. He became such a famous preacher that the church was completely packed whenever, whenever he would get up to preach, so that uh, everyone really wanted to hear what he was going to say. And this would be continuous throughout his life. 
uh, wherever he went, so that's a famous he was as a preacher. The next year, he was asked to take up theology, right, which he actually didn't have training for. Once again, kind of uh, learn as you go type of thing. So in those days, the training for theology was the commentary, was the sentences of St. Peter Lombard. And to get your doctorate in theology, you would write commentaries on it. Okay. And this was uh, a series of sentences and issues that on different questions of the faith primarily, sometimes first principles and then you know, other, other issues, virtues, vices, sacraments, uh, the mass and other issues of dogmatic theology, kind of laid out in questions and everybody studied these questions. People wrote commentaries on them. St. Thomas Aquinas wrote various commentaries on them. And so St. Bernard Bellarmine, even though he, he uh, revered the master, Peter Lombard, at the same time skipped right up to the Summa of St. Thomas Aquinas. Okay, the Summa, that's where you will make rapid advancement. He told all of his students that, you know, skip the whole line of the, the, the sentences. You want to make rapid advancement. Here's the Summa. So for two years, Bellarmine had been uh, teaching theology that when in 1572, a very serious issue cropped up. So one of the doctors at the university, Dr. Michael Dubé, you know, we know him by his Latinized name as Bias. Okay, he was teaching, he also sat at the Council of Trent, it was a well-known theologian, and he sat down to deal with the problems of Calvinism. Right? And what, how can we solve these issues? Now, Dubé hated scholasticism. Right? Absolutely hated it. And then he also hated um, you know, the, anything that was medieval. So he basically said that St. Paul and St. Augustine are my only guides. Right, kind of the four, and he is actually considered the grandfather of the heresy of Jansenism. So because a lot of his ideas devolve into the Jansenist teaching. So he says, basically on St. Augustine alone, and no other teacher, I'm going to come up with my own theory of grace. Right? So he comes up with a theory that basically wipes out man's free will, and a number of other elements that are involved in it. So it's not too far from Calvin's, even though he thinks he's refuting Calvin. So Pope St. Pius V had to write a condemnation of it. So in charity, he wasn't explicitly named, and it was sent with no punctuation in the traditional form of Roman documents to Louvain, and in a big meeting, you know, the, the condemnation was read. And of course, Dubé was said to have wept because he knew he was being condemned in, in his doctrines. So then we have a new controversy rise up, that of the P in common. Okay, so this is a section of Pope St. Pius V's condemnation of Bionism without any punctuation at all. So these opinions, those of Dubé, although tenable to a certain extent in the strict and proper meaning of the words intended by those who wrote them, we condemn as heretical and erroneous. So the question became, well, what happens if we stick a comma in there? So Dubé kind of came in, some of his, his colleagues, they came up with this brilliant idea. Well, what if we do this? What if we put the comma here? So these opinions, although tenable to a certain extent, in the strict and proper meaning of the words intended by those who wrote them, we condemn as heretical and erroneous. That would mean his position was condemned. So he said, let's do this instead. What happens if we put it over here? These opinions, although tenable to a certain extent, in the strict and proper meaning of the words intended by those who wrote them, comma. So if we put the comma there, what we're saying is that they are tenable in the sense that they meant them. Whereas we do it where the, those who argued in favor of Pius V's um, teaching, if we put it here, it clearly condemns his position. So, so arguments for the next year went over the P and comma, <laughs> issues like that. Um, so not, uh, not unlike today, you see such issues fleshed out in blogs and Facebook and other places. So needless to say, St. Pius V was not impressed. And he had to write a follow-up condemnation of bias. And that, so this continued to be argued throughout the life of the um, Bellarmine's time there, right? and then long after too, the Jesuits would continue to be engaged in this battle against not only Bionism, but then later Jansenism after Bellarmine's death. But in the meantime, so Bellarmine is there for a while, in the next five years, and he's teaching theology and also preaching up until his last year. And at the same time, he's also writing his own works on grace, and we'll deal with those in the second section on grace. And he also does come with a formative work on Protestantism, because as he's refuting Bay, he starts uh, teaching his students, lecturing against what Dubé has taught, but at the same time trying to you know, be charitable to him, hoping for his amendment, right? So not un unlike the blog culture we have today, where, oh, look at these heretics, and you have someone's picture up and they're just labeled, me, manifest evil heretic, right? And stuff like that. And so Bellman looked at it and said, this man's soul needs to be saved. 
So he begins addressing Baez's opinions, but without naming him directly and explicitly. So he starts looking for the roots. Where is this coming from? And then it comes to his mind, especially other people he's dealt with. The, what exactly are the Protestant positions on this subject? Because he'd been aware of them, he'd understood them, but he'd never studied them for himself. So he goes to his Jesuit superior to study them. In those days, of course, you have censorship. And just as you do in Protestant countries, specifically England, we're owning, later owning a copy of Bellarmine's works would actually get you put to death in Elizabethan England. But for the moment, and you see, of course, on the Catholic side, you'd get a penance. So it's not so bad. But um, if you, you could not just read a book of Luther's writings or Calvin, you would actually have to go get permission. And then, of course, in this case, his superior was very strict. So Bellman had to study them in his office. And only for a couple hours every day, but he managed it. So he studies all the major Protestant writers at the time, starting with Luther, of course, and also with uh, Calvin, Calvin's book of the Institutes. We'll talk about that more in the next section. And then various other Protestant writers, Wingley, Uncle Apatius, uh, a lot of the early people, John of Brent's. And big, bigger name writers, Martin Bucer, Theodore Beza, right? and they all come into his purview and he reads them all and he and manages to remember much of what they've said. So he becomes uh, very famous for, you know, for his learning all around and then he gets, starts to get very ill. 1574 he gets ill and for years people have been trying to get Bellarmine, get their hands on him. It's a problem of being famous. So St. Charles Borromeo wants to get a hold of Bellarmine, get him in Milan, teaching at the seminary there. And then other people wanted to, but the Pope, now Pope Gregory the Thirteenth, the next one after St. Pius V, he puts the veto in the whole thing. He wants Bellarmine back in, in Rome. And the Fathers of Louvain, they resist, they don't want it, and finally when Bellarmine gets sick, they say, you know what, he really needs his native Italian air. And so Bellarmine himself relates in his autobiography that once he got across the Alps, his health recovered marvelously, almost like a, you know, a new miracle. So, you know, who knows what the reasons were for that. But nevertheless, on his way back, too, it was necessary because in Louvain you had the Dutch rising, the 80 years war with the Spanish, you would wear late clothes. You couldn't just go in and cast it, you might be killed. So he went dressed up as a gentleman with two pistols and a sword, and uh, it was kind of funny, too, for a short Italian. And he goes with a company of, fellow, of travelers, which actually even included some Protestants. And he got along very, very well with them, and then he would say, you know, they kind of dubbed him the captain. And so he would uh, say, oh, let me reconnoitre the ground ahead. So he'd ride ahead of them several miles, and then he'd start saying his breviary. So that way he could get his office done without anybody particularly seeing. So then he would go back, and then finally they get to Genoa, just as you're getting into Italy. And then he uh, gave them his lead, went to the, and then he went to the Jesuit house and changed back into his cassock. The next day, a lot of the people in this company that had rode down with him went to see Mass, to see hear Mass in the Jesuit church, and there was the captain saying the Mass. <laughs> right, which shows it was really exciting for them at that. They got to Rome and they had a special job waiting. So this is actually St. Peter's, as Bellarmine would have known it and would have seen it. The old St. Peter's, the facade is still seen here. Now the old St. Peter's was built in the style of Roman basilicas. It was given to the church by the Emperor Constantine. And so it had a courtyard and a portico, almost in Spanish mission style in a way, which is you're seeing here, which was added to and enlarged during the Middle Ages. And then behind it was the original Constantinian Basilica. Well, it started falling down in the 1460s, or 50s, I'm sorry. Aeneas uh, Silvius, who became Pope Pius II, had a grand plan for building a new one, but couldn't realize it because there wasn't enough money. Get long enough and they get Julius II, 1502. Julius II named his, boasted that he took his name not after the ancient Pope and martyr, Pope St. Julius I, but after Julius Caesar. And he really was a conquering bull of men. He conquered more papal territory than any, any, you know, anyone before him. There was a lot of territory that during the papacy's stay in Avignon were lost. He took it back. And he conceived this grand idea to rebuild St. Peter's. And that's, of course, why he has to fight all these battles. He needs to get papal fiefdoms that'll put money in the coffers so he can do this, as well as pay Raphael and Michelangelo and Bramante, these famous artists that are around him. Well, it also ends up leading to the things that caused the Reformation. Because right, then Julius says, I'm not getting enough money. I need to widen out my range of income. So he commissions indulgences in Spain and in Poland. In Spain, it didn't happen because Cardinal Jimenez, who was a very holy reforming cardinal there, he ripped up the bull. So and because it was not posted, it was not law. And that's the way, and actually in the philosophy of law, you learn that. That as St. Thomas teaches, that, um, that people become bound to the law. The law obliges uh, mediante scientiae, by the medium of knowledge of the law, right? So you have to have the medium of knowledge of it, and that's through promulgation. And if that doesn't happen, it's not law. So in Spain, he never sold indulgences. 
but in Poland you did. And then Leo X, first Medici Pope, comes to town. He says, oh yeah, you've got to keep all this stuff going. So he extends it to Germany. Thus, in Wittenberg, Tetzel, the preacher that he had sent to preach it, was Dominican. And as he's preaching this stuff, he notices that in Wittenberg, the Augustinian convent had the exclusive right to commission indulgences, where they had funded the studies of a certain Martin Luther. So Tetzel transfers the right for indulgences to the Dominicans. They're not, so the Augustinians are not very happy about that. So Luther's superior comes to him and says, why don't you look into this a little bit? Let's see if we can humiliate the Dominicans for, their, for our trouble with all this. So he does, and the fruit is the 95 Thesis. So that's how that, that great you know, conflict comes about. Nevertheless, St. Peter's was being rebuilt and had to continue being rebuilt. The original basilica fell apart as they were laying the groundwork for the current one. So you see the dome, the famous dome of Michelangelo, was com completed during Bellarmine's lifetime. But the rest of this was only completed probably about the time of his death. Right? So all this eventually would be ripped away and give us the St. Peter's that we have today uh, in the future. But nevertheless, whenever he was in the Vatican, this is what Bellarmine would see. So in the Roman College, of the Jesuits, you had a special chair that was founded by Pope Gregory the Thirteenth, who you see here, and he had actually spent a lot of money in the papal treasury, creating the colleges and enlarging the the funds for the seminaries that were training German students, English students, uh, Flemish students, wherever, in order to go fight the battles of the Counter Reformation back in those countries. And so, one of the greatest recipients is the Roman College, which. Um, Pope Gregory, it was called Gregorianum after Pope Gregory the Thirteenth, and it's still named that even today. Of course, now it's a different building, different place. This one was actually seized by the Italian government during the the Masonic Revolution in the nineteenth century, and so now all the documents for that in the Roman College and other things they're actually held by the Italian government, except for a handful. Right? And I know, so I've had to sort through some of them just to find information on this topic, because there's a lot of stuff pertaining to Bellarmine's time there, letters and other things. Well, now they're in the Italian National Archives in Rome, not in the, not in the Vatican or the Jesuits or any place else, so because of that seizure. So nevertheless, Gregory the Thirteenth endowed special money for a chair of controversial theology, and that's basically a 16th century <coughs> word for apologetics, which hadn't been thought yet. Because this time, remember what we said, theology consists of Peter Lombard. You study the questions of Peter Lombard, and to know them better, you study the commentaries in those questions of Peter Lombard, and then you move to other issues. And so, and especially the Church Fathers, heavily neglected. You might know, and everyone knows a good amount of Augustine to a certain point, because Augustine's were the most influential of any of the Church Fathers on the West. But you also have to study many other works involved and to really know the Fathers well. So one guy might become proficient, St. Chrysostom. One guy might become proficient in St. Cyprian of Carthage, or another one in St. Jerome, but you would never know them all. And there was no good handbook for learning them all. It just didn't happen. So Bellarmine comes on the scene, and this chair had failed three times when they tried to get somebody who just couldn't pull it off. So Bellarmine comes in with, well, it's probably not going to work, but hey, let's give it another shot. And he impresses everybody. Not just because he has this absolute uniform knowledge of the Protestants, what they actually taught, quote them in context as, as well, but he can also array the authorities against them. And this is a moment where historical Christianity is a big question because nobody's written church history before. Nobody's ever dealt with this issue. You get history of the church through the works of historians, and for Bellarmine, the primary influence is going to be the Renaissance historians. So people like Platina or Aeneas Silvius and you know, many others we could name. You see them named in the controversies. If you pick up a copy, you'll see them uh, named frequently. But church history hadn't been done yet. It was only starting. And that was through his great friend, Cardinal Baronius, who was basically the founder of church history. And that comes about because the Protestants had produced a book, the first church history that was ever produced, it was Luther. And it was called The Centuries of Maud Dibberg. And the author of it was a man who had a Latinized nom de plume, Delyricus. And his actual name was Matthew Flywitz. Well, Flywitz was one of the most earnest disciples of Luther. So he got men and money together and produced this work, The Centuries of Maud Dibberg, which has one basic thesis that the early church was Lutheran and not Catholic, not Papist, mm -hmm. and of course that the Pope is the Antichrist. And so you know, so this is now going to be proved by history. And this was actually really new. It startled a lot of people. It was very interesting. A lot of scholars looked at it. Nobody ever produced a work like that before. And so it was really influential in the first you know, few years of its existence until Catholics managed to reply. Because then when you plumb through the pages, then what you find is as a work of history is absolutely useless. Mm 
and that's by the testimony of several Protestant historians, like also even Isaac Casabon, who's an extremely anti-Catholic Calvinist historian. And he said that the centuries were but a worthless jumble of things that, that could not possibly present real history in any form. Right? And that's from Calvinists who hated the church. So they, but nevertheless, when they first came out, they were really compelling, especially on the question of the Pope and the, in the early church. And then they, you know, so Bellarmine cites this a number of times in the controversies where he says what they call blemishes in the fathers, they call heresies among us, right? And that was the way to get around the fact that the fathers were Catholic, not Protestant. So it, anyway, so Bellarmine, you know, continues exposing things like this in this chair of controversial theology. So he starts along the same line, you know, outlines as the controversies, the, the books themselves. Um, so here's the first copy. Now what happened is this class was wildly successful. And before long, when word got out about it, bishops and cardinals as well as uh, seminarians were crowding Bellarmine's lectures to, to hear more, to hear all these, you know, the restatements of the faith and the refutations of Protestantism. Not only because Bellarmine, you know, wielded the authorities and just had teaching, he, he could clearly explain why Luther's position X is false by scripture and then the fathers and then by the more recent authorities, obviously the medievals, the scholastics, the greater among them, especially St. Thomas, St. Bernard, St. Bonaventure, uh, Duns Scotus, and many others that Bellarmine would muster up against the, you know, the various Protestant teachings. And so that was always the methodology, first scripture, then the fathers. And his idea for this was actually seen in St. John Fisher's book against Luther. And Bellarmine mentions that in several letters. The Holy Martyr of Rochester is how he usually refers to St. John Fisher. Because Fisher is not really known because it's never made its way into English. He wrote numerous books against the Protestants and they were celebrated as being the best works against them in all of Christendom. So much so that at Trent, we will hear about how St. Thomas was the guy at Trent They put up the Summa Theologiae. Well, actually in the, the decree on justification, St. John Fisher cited more than St. Thomas or anyone else, except Holy Scripture itself because he was that influential and all the fathers are present there. And it was influential in Bellman, and he proceeds on that same plan. Okay, the fathers, the, uh, in the, in the scripture of the fathers, and then the later theologians. So the Pope heard about this and said, wow, this is marvelous. So he orders Bellarmine to put it all into a book, which is very laborious and painstaking to get a book then ordered correctly and then sent to the printers. And that's no easy task in those days. Today, so I publish books because I read it up in a word processor. And then I send it to the company of Princeton, and then us all of a sudden we have a book. In those days, you write a hand manuscript, and you have to purposely write slower to keep everything neat so they don't misspell stuff and misread it. And then you, they has, it has to be sent to the printers. Then what the printers have to do is they have to take a, a box, and they have to pull all these letters off the case and kind of arrange them. And if you, in case you haven't noticed that the, the capital letters are on the top, and the lower, the small letters are on the bottom. That's how we get upper and lower case. That's what that refers to, is the cases where you had all your fonts and you put them in, you had to arrange them backwards. And then you had this thing that looks like a wine press. And then you get a book, you get a page. You get one page, but it happened a lot faster than somebody writing it down. So then you get 100 pages and 1,000, the exact same page. So this is printed in that method. And of course, you have to have this drawn up by an engraver, right? and you have to sit that in the middle. You do this consistently, and then you know you, you, all your printers tired out. Then you go to the next one, and then those and so those pages sit basically dry. And then once you've got it all together, you get the sections and the leaves, and then the more sections come out, and you bind them all together with really good tying, and the paper is very high quality, and thus it lasts. I have a book over there you can browse, which is a 1721 copy of the Controversies, which also is printed in that very same manner, and uh, you can feel free to browse that. So it, uh, it's about three, almost 300 years old. And you know, largely the same as uh, this. This is the original edition from Engelstock. So Bellarmine worked and he did that. Out. So the controversies, we'll talk about that more in the next one. But principally, they they deal they, they come off by these headings. So first you have Scripture, Christ and the Papacy. You have the the Church, so ecclesiology. Then the councils, the Church militant, Marx, the Church is you know more uh, fleshing out the Church. The members of the Church was a very lengthy book. Uh, and then you have purgatory canonizations of the saints, images, and relics. And then he does a 1,200-page book in very massive pages on the sacraments. Right. And then finally, uh, indulgences, which was supposed to be in the sacraments, but uh, he couldn't get it done for the printers in time, so it got put into this one, this third volume. Then grace, free will, and justification, right? the main issues of the Reformation. So, so over 2 million words, all told, in Latin, by the way. 
So of course, sometimes <laughs> fifties and green at that point, but he's impressed by being in heaven. And so finally, when they were published at Ingolstadt, back in those days, prayers didn't have catalogs. They had a big fair, and you sent all your, your agents to bring the books to the great book fairs, which would happen like in Cologne in Germany, or Champlain in Paris, and some other places, Reims had one. And so agents everywhere would live accounts and nobles and, and important people, they would send agents to go buy them. And they're very expensive. As I mentioned, the process that it happens is very laborious and everything. So at last you get the, the controversy. So everyone is, is excited about this. And Protestants are very unnerved by it. So you have this one fellow named Dujun, and he's Latinized to uh, Junius. He says, Methinks it is not one Bellarmine who speaks in these pages. It is the whole Jesuit phalanx, the entire legion of them, mustered for our destruction. Right. So this rumor got around for a while. That, oh, there is no Bellarmine. It's, it's all the Jesuits doing this. So eventually, Bellarmine, you know, in his secretary, it was a, a Greek Jesuit, Father Yudalman Ioannis, he wrote to it testified having witnessed Bellarmine composing the entirety of the controversies. So then you get, um, there's a zillion testimonies to the controversies, and we'd be here all day if I went through all those. So I'm just going to focus on this one. This is from uh, Benjamin Anthony Carrier, who was a chaplain to King James, and this is later known in England. Bellarmine became a big, great fixture in the Church of England, a great specter of their ecclesiastical landscape. It's almost like a gargoyle looking at them. And so this is one of the reasons why we see Bellarmine is he's anglicized, and he's been so continuously anglicized in English. Whereas on the other hand, other famous Italians like Galileo, right, stay, you know, they keep their Italian O's, but Bellarmine managed to get anglicized. So anyway, so this chaplain of King James had read the controversies because in England they would allow books in Latin to be sent in. And they would read the, you know, for the English divines to read and say, oh yeah, what are the papists coming up with now? So they could compose responses. And Bellman's work had made them particularly mad. You couldn't even get your doctorate unless you had um, written a work against Bellman, usually his work on the marks of the church. That's the one they hated the most. Mm -hmm. And then um, several other ones. So, so this fellow, who's a chaplain of King James I, read it and you know, and it immediately, you know, he, he realized the truth. And so then he, he took some pretext to, to go to the waters at Spa in, in, uh, in Germany and then was received into the church. So he wrote to Bellarmine to thank him. And he said, had it been possible for me to remain ignorant of the truth contained in your writings or to deny it, I think this present letter would never have gone to Italy. But since I could not escape the light of your teachings, nor, on the other hand, endure the colonies of unjust tongues at home, I have left behind me all the books of my library at Canterbury and given up all my other worldly goods under pretext of taking the waters at Spa and of traveling into the Palatinate. It's one of the regions of Germany, by the way, of the Holy Roman Empire, which was Protestant. It was actually James the, King James the first um, sister was married to the Elector Palatinate, so it was definitely Protestant territory. So you could say, oh, I'm going over there. I was, okay, great, sounds an excellent idea. I have now been received into the Catholic Church by your fathers at Cologne, and so with very good reason, I think I ought to write to your illustrious lordship, not so much to beg your help in my exile as to thank you for the freedom and salvation of my soul. I was told recently, for many years, preacher to the king, with all my heart I chose the Catholic communion, commended to me by your works more than by any other cause under God, in preference to the position I had already attained and the still brighter hopes that were mine. And so I thank your Lordship with all my heart, not only in my own name, but also in the names of very many learned men in England who kindle their lamps and draw warmth daily from your flame. May God renew your old age like unto the eagles for the peace of his church and the conversion of England. So there's in zillions of other testimonies like this. And so Bellarmine responded to uh, the, the former chaplain of King James, thanking him and, and praising him because giving up authority, you know, uh, prestige is no easy thing for men, especially royal prestige. Right? That's what I, if you, you're like a chaplain to the king, you're going places unless you do something wrong to displease him, like become Catholic in a country where Catholicism is illegal and you'll be killed for it. But, um, you know, you're going places and to give all that up is a hard thing to do for men. As we, you see, we can't, uh, you know, look down too much on people who have this you know, temptation to human respect where great things are happening and then you see the truth that's going to destroy all that. That is a hard decision to make. And I know people who have done it. It's very, very difficult. So the controversies were not without Catholic critics who also complained that all the works of Luther and Calvin are already here. Why, why would they need to even bother reading them? But nevertheless, the positive effect was so such that you know the, this became the standard of theology.
for many centuries, actually all the way up until about the 1950s, which we'll get to in the next section. So Bellarmine, in the midst of preparing all these volumes, teaching, as well as now being finding his way into Roman congregations and teaching other, um, other disciplines, was asked to pick up and go to France. In France, you had a very big problem. And we, it's kind of, we, we miss it in our history books. This period doesn't really make much, because everyone knows St. Joan of Arc and how it, France is carved up into three pieces and it, it looks hopeless to restore the Valois monarchy. But then Joan of Arc comes and saves the day more or less. Well, in this century, France is 10 times more divided than it was during the time of Joan of Arc. And you have, because you have the arrival of Calvinism in France. And so the Calvinists, for violent uprisings, much like they did in Holland, or they even have help coming in from Holland or from England, helping them form violent uprisings. So everybody's heard, of course, of the St. Bartholomew's Massacre. Oh, those evil Catholics, they assassinated the biggest Protestant military leader, and then they came in and, and savagely killed every Protestant in the city. And unfortunately, that part was true. But that part misses what happened before namely the seven or eight towns that the Calvinist Huguenots had massacred down to every man, woman, and child. And so people used to say, remember Montserrat, remember Montserrat, where the Calvinists killed all our brethren. And this is what happened in the St. Bartholomew's Day massacres. Everyone remembered this and say, decided, now it's time to settle some scores and get some revenge, which also is not good. But that's what leads up to it. It's not as if, oh, the, you know, the way Protestants depicted it, of course. Oh, the church trying to snuff out the true gospel, right? And that's, that's still how they depict it. So what happens at this point is the Calvinists have a champion, Henri Bourbon. And Henri Bourbon had converted back to the Catholic Church and had married the sister of the French king. But then was, uh, you know, after the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, left Paris and then resumed being a Calvinist. So he became the champion of the Calvinist party. And what happened unexpectedly after the ascent of Henri III to the throne of France is that his wife died and he had no children. So now it was distinctly possible that the Calvinist, Henri Bourbon, would be the heir to the throne of the kingdom of France. And that this would take the eldest daughter of the church in the way of England. And this was not a good thing. So Pope Sixtus V, who we'll talk about in a little bit, he had um, decided now is the time to send a legation. We got to do something to, to manage this situation. You know, maybe somehow work for the conversion of Henri Bourbon. And that ends up becoming the policy the church follows. Whereas in France, it's never Bourbon for that reason, have we? Never Bourbon. We can't have him, no matter what, you know, Satan instead of Bourbon. And it's almost the way it's going. A lot of the French clergy absolutely hate it, but you have nothing in reserve if Henri III died. And what happens is Henri III didn't like that his greatest supporters were the Catholic League, which was headed by the Geese. The Geese were a famous family in France. They had several cardinals. And they were people looked to them like the great champions of the church in France and not to the king. And that made him annoyed like Saul before David. So he decided now is the time to get rid of these guys. So he has them assassinated. And the people find out they're not particularly happy. So he, you know, so Henri III has to quit Paris and on his way out he's assassinated by a Franciscan for, for whatever reason. And consequently, Henri Bourbon, by the laws of primogeniture, is king. So this is really problematic now for the church. So the, um, the Pope had sent Cardinal Cajunet, who was a Spanish diplomat, and they, they decided that a theologian would be needed. So Sixth and Fifth sent Bellarmine along. And uh, kind of stop everything you're doing, go to Paris. <laughs> All obedient, so let's get going. And they did, and it was a very perilous route when they were at Dijon. And the, the Cardinal Cajun had finished Mass, and he heard a rumor that uh, Beaumont's troops were ready to assault him and take them all prisoner. And so as a result, then he, you know, he was nervous about it. And then he heard a rumor, oh, no, it's a ruse to keep you from getting to Paris. So he, he stopped, and he took him to the chalice, and he put two pieces of paper, and one said go, the other said don't go. And then uh, he waited, everyone was gone, he picked one out, and he said, don't go. So we ordered everyone to stop, unsaddle, wait. And sure enough, there really was a deputation from Henri Bourbon of soldiers ready to, to grab and grab a hold of them. Mm -hmm. But eventually they do make it to Paris, and shortly after they make it to Paris, there's the Siege of Paris. Henri Bourbon had won some several striking victories against the Catholic League, and now decided his, his opportunity to come to take Paris. And you see Bourbon right here with his man-at-arms. Of course, an idealized armor that they didn't actually wear in those times. Uh, at most, you had just a piece of plate. The articulated armor is, is mostly for decoration. So as the age of jousting has kind of disappeared, and it's not as much looked upon as it used to be. And now, you know, the guns have made armor useless, so, so that you don't really wear it all that much anymore. 
Bourbon had decided that instead of blow Paris to, up to the smithereens, he was going to, because it was such a beautiful city, he would just starve it out by siege. Well, Bellarmine's in the middle of the city. So he takes his time, St. Robert, uh, studying manuscripts in the Paris Library, the money he was given for food, he distributed to the poor. But the problem is there was no food to be had in those days. So his rations of boiled shoe leather he used to give to uh, whatever poor person that was uh, passing by. It was a really miserable time. And eventually the sieges lifted the Boubon tried to make his way into the city. It was actually the Jesuits who were manning one of the walls who noticed his troops scaling up. And so they sounded the alarm and they repulsed the attempt to storm the city. And then it was saved. Then the Catholic League was coming and to break the siege. And so Boubon had to, had to leave. And so the conclusion of that it took another 10 years, but the uh, altogether for everything to kind of unfold. But within a few years, Henri Boubon realized he was never going to win now. And France needed a king, and the Catholic League realized it. And so they all accepted. Henri Bourbon was king as long as he would convert. And Bourbon said, Ah, Paris est digne pour les mass. Paris is worth the mass. So Sixtus V was the pope during this period, and it was a very stormy relationship that Bellarmine had with him. Sixtus V was a very imperious uh, pope, and one of his greatest achievements was liberating the papacy from the influence of the Spanish. Pope St. Pius V and Gregory XIII, for all their great achievements, had unfortunately made the church too uh, dependent on the Spaniards in so many things. They relied on Philip II's military power and Gregory XIII's war with Elizabeth in England and also for the wars with the Turks in Lepanto. And they absolutely needed the Spanish for everything. So Sixtus is determined, I'm the Pope, I'm the supreme ruler of Earth, I'm going to get rid of the Spaniards. And he does. And it's a great victory in terms of the political independence of the papacy. So while Bellarmine is away in France, there's two things that happen. One is, he wants to reform the Jesuits' constitutions. And the Jesuit superior, Claudio Acquaviva, is rather, no, no, we're not going to do that. <laughs> no, no, no. You're not going to reform our constitutions. Pope says, absolutely, I'm the head of the church, darn it. I can do this. And so he pushes the issue, and he's really annoyed with the Jesuits. And then at, at the same time, he has another problem. So he has, he's a canonist. He's a canon lawyer. And all of his friends are canonists. And they say, did you see what Father Bellarmine wrote in the controversies? So in the controversy of the Roman Pontiff, book five is the very last book, it's the shortest book of the whole thing. Bellarmine talk, talks about the indirect power of the papacy. He rejects the, 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 uh, the doctrine of the canonists that the Pope is Lord of the world. So the first couple several chapters deal with refuting the notion that the Pope is Lord of the whole world and every king is merely his vassal in terms of direct political power. And this was held very deeply by the candidates who had misread the achievements of, say, a Gregory VII and an Innocent III, and held the idea that the Pope really was the head of the whole world. So Bellarmine cites St. Thomas, he cites St. Bonaventure, St. Augustine, all the fathers, and that, the, that Christ himself rejected direct personal rule of the world, even though he has it by divine right being God. And the Pope, as his vicar, likewise, does not have direct rule over the whole world, but just indirect. And this issue just keeps coming up throughout Bellarmine's life. It is a very hard issue to deal with in that time. So Sixtus V says, yeah, <clears throat> that's right, he's wrong, isn't he? I'm the Pope, and I'm Lord of the world. And he, and he gets very annoyed by this whole process. So you know, he's, he's thinking, but the whole con congregation of the Index is staffed by Bellarmine's friends, and they agree with Bellarmine, not with the Pope. And so but the Pope orders the book to be placed on the Index of Forbidden Books. And that's, of course, where it goes, uh, but only for a month. So then. During Cajetan's stay in France, the Pope was also equally angry with Cajetan, and because Cajetan was Spanish, he was not carrying out what the Pope asked him to do, because Philip II was arguing instead of the people solution of Henri Bourbon being king of France, make Philip II's daughter uh, queen of France. That'll solve all the problems, right? and that's what Cajetan wanted to push. So he was delaying carrying out the Pope's orders. The Pope was mad, and then he thought for sure he was going to be in some real trouble, so a letter comes from Rome. And they say, what do you think it is? And Bellarmine said, well, this announces the Pope's death. Right? And everyone laughed at him, oh, yeah, yeah, or whatever. And then, and then uh, Cajun comes out of the room, the Pope's dead. So Sixtus V had died within only about a month of putting Bellarmine on the index for this question of the indirect power of the papacy. And where the next Pope uh, took it off immediately. Right, so because in this very strange company he had come on. Same thing for the Dominican Franz, uh, Francisco Vittoria was also put on the index for the very same proposition in his works. So they both got off the index, but there is still today a, a volume to be seen, not this particular one, this is the only picture I can find, but I've actually seen the work in the Vatican archives itself. It's a 
quarto folio volume, about, you know, so big, it's only numbered on the odd pages, and about page 72, you find, uh, you know, Robert Bellarmine, De on Controversies of the Christian Faith, which ironically is dedicated to Sixth V, until it shall revise that very section, uh, the section on the indirect power of the papacy. So it's still there, so you can still see the Vatican Archives, he really was on the index, although it was never promulgated, so it was never formal, but it was ready to be. The other reason for Sixtus V's early demise is that he was working on revising the Vulgate. And he decided, I'm going to do it myself. Right? And this is a very long and contentious issue, and I don't have the time to go into it all. So Sixtus V decides he's going to revise the Vulgate by himself. He redoes all the versification, makes a lot of errors, and then so that everyone in the world is waiting for this new Vulgate, which has not actually been put out yet at this time. And even the people kind of printed their own. And then it, uh, he dies, disappears. So then we come to, there are two popes in between, they died very quickly, we come to Clement VIII. So Bellarmine is back in Rome after that legation in France. And he comes to, uh, I was actually Pope Innocent XI, and he says, you know what we need to do? We need to fix this whole mess of Sixth to the Fifth. Let's just, let's just take this Bible, you know, and, and, you know, issue it under his name, but let's get rid of all the stuff he changed and kind of restore it back to the way it was, and then put in all these other, and let's put footnote commentary as well. Well, it didn't really work. But basically saying, let's just say it was just the printers or some other thing, right? And it's one of those things where one of his biographers, uh, Fulgiathi, says that it was more of a, like with uh, St. Ambrose says about Jacob in the whole question of Esau, when he pretends to be Esau, it was more of a marvel or a miracle than a lie, right? That's what St. Ambrose says. It was a similar thing with Bellamy, because he was basically saying, let's stretch the truth a little bit for the sake of the integrity of the Holy See. Now, the Protestants did pick up on that, actually, and they had wrote a book on the whole subject of the church trying to change the Bible, see? And it was, it was regrettable, because some of the copies of 6th to 5th did manage to leak out, and some people got them. But. So, and it was, so Bellarmine served as a theologian, and on the, his various commissions, advised the Pope in a number of things. And then he was made the rector of the Roman College, and later the provincial of the, the province of Naples. And here we see Bellarmine's lighthearted attitude, so now he's in authority for the very first time as being the head of the Roman College, and so he allows all manner of music and encourages all the students to sing, and to sing madrigals like Monteverdi, if you ever heard Monteverdi, is things like that. He got one sheet of madrigals and he loved the, the melody, but then he looked at the words, and he saw they were about a certain signora. So he decided, well, this has to go. So he actually rewrote and reset to the verse a, an entire song about God in the vernacular which is, it was actually really beautiful, it would be nice to sing. And a lot of people would do things like that with some things, some love madrigals of Monteverdi, which are just indecent for polite company. So the, uh, and the church then would actually use those melodies with new settings to Latin hymns or something. Okay. So in the time as rector of the Roman College, Bellarmine, of course, encouraged all the students to come to him with any particular issue. And one of those students was St. Aloysius Gonzaga. St. Aloysius Gonzaga is uh, one of those saints that as St. Francis de Sales says is to be marveled at rather than imitated. It's one of those saints God puts there to show us the, the marvels that are possible with his grace. Because from and Bellarmine himself eulogized St. Aloysius very heavily. We'll mention that in a minute. St. Aloysius, as a young Jesuit, was absolutely devoted to helping the poor, especially the plague stricken. And plague was a big problem in those days when you didn't know about these little microscopic organisms known as bacteria. And, you know, death is always around, and you could die. This is actually a very serious thing, going near a plague victim. Don't do that. And Aloysius did it happily, embracing them and helping them in all the different endeavors he needed to. So, as a result, he caught this plague and died. So, and he also put himself under severe penances that broke his health. And at one time, St. Robert Bellarmine, who was his confessor, said, why don't you follow the advice of your confessor? You know, and, and not put on these severe penances on yourself. And St. Aloysius said, because my confessor is a hypocrite. Because St. Robert Bellarmine put on the worst penances upon himself, even while advising this very light and, <laughs> and easy life for, for St. Aloysius. So he had really nothing he could say to the two quoque argument. And then as St. Aloysius fell ill, St. Robert Bellarmine was constantly at his bedside. So he related later in a, in a eulogy of the saint, that he said, uh, try to tell me, Aloysius, try to tell me you know, why, how it is that you can focus so absolutely on God without any distractions whatsoever. And uh, Luigi was actually his name. Aloysius came in the canonization documents at the request of one of, the, one of his family, the Gonzaga family, not your wife. So Luigi, Aloysius, he responds, how is it that anyone could focus on God and be distracted? So amazing. 
And even Bellarmine was awed by this, who himself, by all the canonization documents, had a very deep spiritual and devotional life. And so he was always devoted to the memory of sound wishes. He's depicted here giving last rites, as he did give him his last rites. And so he never ceased to actually promote St. Aloysius' cult. And if you go to the church of San Ignacio, that's uh, where once he was canonized, that's where he, uh, he was buried. And there's a magnificent um, altar set to him. And of course, because he was canonized much earlier than St. Robert, which we'll mention later. Uh, just next to it is St. Robert's body, because he, he had his soul to be buried at the feet of his spiritual child, uh, St. Albanitius, but it couldn't be done yet, so he was actually the Jesu for a number of years until his beatification, where the, finally the relics were translated. And so you can see his body in a big reliquary with a silver uh, death mask. So, anyway, so Cardinal. One of the things that, as we noted in the beginning, St. Robert says in his autobiography, did not want to be cardinal. He did not want ecclesiastical dignity. He did not want to be an important man. He just wanted to be a humble Jesuit. So the rumors started coming around. And of course, his very good friend, Cardinal Baronius, who was the prefect of the Vatican Apostolic Library, and who was the forcibly made to be a cardinal. He was a disciple of St. Philip Neri, who was an oratorian father. Right? He had actually been urging Clement VIII to make St. Robert uh, Pope. No, St. Robert had an interesting relationship with, with Pope Clement VIII. Pope Clement VIII was a very humane man. He was, a, a, um, St. Philip Mary was a spiritual director, yet at the same time, you know, he, he was a canonist and he also come sometimes would just kind of deal with things the way he saw them. And so he said, this man is the smartest man I know. He needs to be a cardinal. That's it. And St. Robert did not want to do it. So when, when the news came, he took all his friends together and said, what can I do, what can I do? I, I don't want to be a cardinal. And then they said, well, the Pope is ordering it. There's really nothing you could do. So then finally, he uh, presents himself uh, after the consistory to be invested by the Pope in the purple. And he, he says uh, to the Pope, you know, but please, Holy Father, I don't want to post shish, not another word. You will accept this under pain of mortal sin for disobedience. So that was it. There's nothing left. So then, and now the problem is, now what does it mean to be a cardinal? Today, a cardinal Usually he's a cardinal archbishop. In fact, since the legislation of Pope Paul VI in the 1960s, every cardinal must be made a bishop, at least a titular archbishop over something. And they're, you know, they don't have palatial residences like they did in those days, right? So usually they'll live in the archiepiscopal palace or wherever the chancery is. Back in those days, anyone could be a cardinal. A layman could be a cardinal, a deacon could be a cardinal, a priest could be a cardinal. When they were a cardinal, they became basically minor nobility. They were now princes of the church, which meant in those days, in the language of those days, you had a household, you had a suite, you had servants, and a lot of the cardinals, this is why you had Episcopal absenteeism, which Bellarmine himself would have did. Council of Trent really came out against this strong, because it was one of the greatest evils in the church. Episcopal absenteeism. The bishop is the bishop of this diocese. He's being paid all kinds of money, and he says, you know what, why don't I want to live in this little place? I could live in Rome, or Paris. These wonderful places with all this, all these great sights to see. Or even uh, blessed Pope Pius IX said they hated like his hometown because Rome was so much more interesting. He always liked Rome. It had all these great sights, theater, music, and it's the same sentiment a few hundred years earlier. So bishops just didn't hang around their diocese. They didn't want to be in their diocese. They wanted to be where it was fun. And especially if you were a lay cardinal, even better, right? And then you know, or a priest, cardinal priest, then you're basically nobility, and you might be important for these or other reasons. And you, of course, you're close to the seat of power, you're close to the Pope, so if you're particularly ambitious, that's what you want to do. This is the exact opposite of what Bellarmine wants to do. So he looks over the books of various holy people, especially St. Antoninus. He's one, he's a late medieval we almost never hear about. He wrote a book on ecclesiastical dignities, talking about their importance and how they're readily to be used. And so, see, today you hear a lot about this church of the poor. The church of the poor, that you're not supposed to have uh, great and wonderful things, and you know, because that you know, we should have. Uh... See, I live near Spokane. I live in Idaho, and I live close to Spokane, Washington. And down there, there's a beautiful hotel. It's called the Davenport. Right? It's, it's an old '30s hotel. It's been renovated, and they have all kinds of really interesting architecture and you know, great stuff. Well, if a poor man is to walk into there, he's going to be shown the door within a couple of minutes, <laughs> and he's not going to be allowed in. But if you go into a church, in a really grand church, you know, this is art and architecture that even the poor should have, right? So, so we're, we're pervaded with this idea that you should only have this very simple church and not have really have much decoration, much adornment, much beauty. And that's really a, a really negative idea. And it's contrary to what the fa even the fathers talked about in terms of the dignity of the church, because Christ is rich. You know, his church should look beautiful to the eye, but that doesn't mean you're living in the high room. That's what St. Antoninus was arguing 
in the whole question of ecclesiastical dignity. So Bellarmine studied his work over and set up his suite as best he could. He wrote to the advice of friends, please just tell me I'm not going to lose my soul. He was actually, by the tone of his letters, he was convinced he would lose his soul for being a cardinal. Because now there's all this wealth, whereas he has always been a poor religious, and he doesn't want you know, the, to personally have the sumptuousness of this. Bearing the, the glory and the dignity of the office wasn't a problem in terms of you know, carrying out what the church requires, but in terms of having a sumptuous suite and having all kinds of exquisite food, he was, wasn't going to do it. He refused all these bad things the Pope tried to confer upon him that would give him income, but he never could have done the job. He absolutely refused it. He had a house of only 10 people which sounds like a lot, 10 servants, but it was because that was what was minimally necessary to attend on the Pope, because you had to have so many servants to, to, to attend on the Pope in those times, too. And he always made sure they were paid well, and they had you know, very good accommodations. He just had a very simple mattress that he slept on. And he wanted to do boards, he said, I'm too old, I can't do the boards like I'd like to. So, so he lives a very holy life as a cardinal under Pope Clement VIII and as the theologian. And then he, Pope Clement VIII invites him to give a, draw up a memorial for reform, okay? You know, what do you think is wrong in the church? And so this is printed in the back of my translation of On the Roman Pontiff, this particular memorial, at least as it concerns the papacy primarily, is a part of it I didn't put in. So, but he gives the first thing to the Pope. The Pope is, you know, the supreme <coughs> in, all, but in all his offices on earth, the papal states, everything, but the most supreme thing of all is being head of the universal church. And his job, is to save the souls in the universal church. So if, he says, the Pope appoints bad bishops, those bad bishops will appoint bad priests, and these bad priests will not save souls, and so the souls of all the people that are damned, their blood will be required at the Supreme Pontiff's hands. And Pope Clement VIII wrote a response to it, and you can find it, although in Latin, in uh, Familiaris Domestice, which is domestic exhortations, they include this at the end. And the Pope says, we admit that we have sinned, but what else can be done in so many cases? Are all these bishops around the world, and didn't Christ choose Judas? Right? But it's completely a non-answer, because Christ is the Son of God. Christ is, you know, Christ is, he knows that Judas is going to betray him, and this is necessary to fulfill scripture, whereas the Pope has a different job. He's there to save souls, and so it doesn't matter that if a Judas sneaks in, despite his best effort, that's one thing, but his job is to make sure he has Peter's and not Judas's. And that's one of the problems that, that for so long, like we mentioned, popes in appointing people for different reasons and nepotism, nepotism and these other problems, it was a huge problem for a long time. So then the next thing he goes on is Episcopal absenteeism. A man who does not live in the diocese but continues to live in the income is like a man who divorces his wife and lives on her dowry anyway. Right? And that's, that's his view of Episcopal absenteeism. So then a controversy rose, which we'll talk about in the next section, on efficacious grace. And so the, the Pope, you know, uh, Bellarmine was a very keen critic of the Pope's policies and especially his views in that regard. So the Pope decided, you know, let's test what he's saying in this memorial. Let's see if he's worth his salt as a reformer. And so the Pope sends St. Robert to become the Bishop of Capua. Now Capua is a very ancient city. You see it in Roman times. It was one of those cities that defected to Hannibal during the Punic Wars in ancient Rome. And it, it, the original city of ancient times was destroyed in a big earthquake in the 7th century. So they built a new one. And so it was very medieval in its character. Its last bishop, bishop Cesare Costa, hadn't resided in the diocese except maybe once, 20 years back. And it was in a miserable state of uh, uh, disrepair in terms of all kinds of things. While well, he's, of course, living in Roman income. So Bellarmine, you know, as soon as he's consecrated a bishop, uh, within two weeks, he's gone which was almost to the point of indecency. Back in those days, if you appointed someone a bishop, you couldn't get him out of the curia, because this is the center of power. This is where you want to be, right? So if you appointed someone a bishop, that you would be, you know, decades probably. He might die before he ever even sees his diocese. And then instead, they're just paying some vicar to kind of administer stuff, you know, a lot less who doesn't have the authority. So Bellarmine's gone within a month. Totally unexpected shock. The court even shocked the Pope himself, who really wasn't expecting Bellarmine to go that quick. So he gets into Capua. And the first thing he does is to start addressing the cathedral. This is what the cathedral looks like now. This is my photo from, I forget. Of course, at the time I was there, I didn't know much about any of these, these issues. Mm -hmm. So you know, and it still reflects a lot of the work that St. Robert Bellarmine had done to see that, oh, I've got another picture. They, of course, after the council to um, do the adornamento, they had to clear out all the great art and our iconography that was on the ceiling and other things, which is unfortunate. Um, actually, do I have that picture? There you go. There we are. That's what it used to look like before they, they plastered it over and made it simple. 
So unfortunately, um, that's a, that photo. Where did I find that? It was in a book that's in Italian. I think it's from the forties, but anyway. So, so Bellman first starts off when he gets there, he, he's received all the people gather around him, you know, the, the procession they planned through the city, they couldn't do it because the streets were so thronged with people you couldn't even move. And it's one, one feature about Italians even today is that when there's a man who everyone knows to be a saint, you always want to be around him because it's, you know, you get some measure hoping the holiness will kind of rub off on you, right? Because it's a very a realization of their very imperfect lives that you always want to be around saints, right? So it's part of the, the Italian realism. So the first thing that he does as a reforming bishop is he tries to deal with all the problems of the poverty in the diocese. So all the, the salary he has as a bishop, he looks at what the minimum amount he needs to run the church and deal with his household and everything else, he's doing his best to succor all the needs. Right, so he says, as our current Holy Father says, go went out to the peripheries, all the, the poor and the, the worst cases in Capua. He wanted to make sure he could fix, correct, secure. This is the Archbishop's Palace, uh, which is exactly, I'm not sure what it looks like now. I didn't see it when I was there, but this is what um, it looked like pretty much at Bellman's time. And so he, this is where the poor would gather daily to, to be prepared to receive alms from him. All right, and his table, of course, likewise when he was a cardinal, I'll get to his almsgiving here. When he was a cardinal in Rome before he became a bishop, so he has the money coming, he would always do everything he could to give as much as he could to the poor. He had his servant, uh, Guidotti, was his major duomo, is it kind of like your secretary, your master of house. His job was to go out and find poor family, families that were, you know, generally of means, but were, you know, because they were kind of minor gentry, they're too proud to say they needed help. And there's a lot of those. They tend to fall through the cracks when we talk about the poor. People who look like they're their means, but they're really struggling. So he would find out who they were and be able to give them stuff anonymously so they wouldn't have any shame over it. And then likewise, any, any poor people, there's one person that, um, you know, the father died and he was nervous about the, so the daughter, so he provided dowries for all the, the girls so they get married, because back in those days you had to provide a dowry in order to get married, or else you couldn't get married to people in certain classes, even if you were of the same class. So it was just kind of the funny workings of, of ancient society. So. Bellarmine, um, you know, gave everything one time. There was a poor uh, Irishman in his house looking for food, so he cut uh, his his dinner in half, like St. Martin in his cloak, and gave him the other half. Right? And there's um, one another touching story is that he uh, he was given this great silver jug by Cardinal Aldo Brandini, who was the Pope's nephew, and it would be a great offense to sell it. So and he, and so he knew that his master of house was always hiding money because he was alarmed at the rate which Bellarmine was giving alms, right? He was afraid that he'd be, the cardinal himself would need alms before too long. So, and Bellarmine knew this, but he didn't uh, question for it. But when some poor person would come up and say, oh, I don't have any money now. Oh, uh, you know, Pedro, uh, Pietro, why don't you go get the, the silver jug from the cardinal and go give that to the poor guy and he could pawn it. He'd go, no, no, no. And then he'd go dig up some money that he was hiding and give it to the poor man. So as he mentioned, that, that Bellarmine's mother's mania for alms finds its way into Bellarmine as he, as he realizes that he doesn't need anything in his life. So he instead he's giving it to God's people who do. Again, another occasion he has, because every cardinal gets a ring as a prince of the church. So one time a, a poor beggar asked Bellarmine in his carriage for some alms and he looked in his purse, he didn't have any. So he said, here, take this to a certain pawnbroker by the Via della Scrafa. Now, if you know where the Via della Scrafa is, it's right by the, um, the Piazza Novona uh, in Rome, famous piazza in Rome. It's also where Car the, the painter Caravaggio got in the fight and killed someone and had to flee. And there's also one of some of his best paintings in the, the French churches over there. But anyway, there, so there used to be a pawnbroker there. And then, you know, and then Bellarmine would come back later and buy the ring back. And this happened several times according to the canonization documents that, that he would do this, which was a huge scandal. Somebody found out that he pawned his ring to give it to the poor. So always he's got the poor in his mind. Uh, when he was in Capua, there was a man who was dying, and the man could not compose himself to do a last confession. He was so afraid for his daughters because he knew he was dying and he was leaving them nothing. So Bellarmine took him by the hand and said that I will provide, from now on your family can look at me as their father. I will provide for them as if I were their, they were my own children. And the man was so pleased and so satisfied that at last he was able to compose himself to make his confession that he died thereafter. And Bellarmine was as good as his word. He made sure that all of the girls that had you know, the right upbringing, education, he found very excellent and holy husbands for them, and all those ended very happily. Another case where there was a man who was shot right near the cathedral, and so Bellarmine happened to be, be nearby, so he came to see what was going on, and the poor guy was dying, 
and he found out what happened, and he said, you know, oh, uh, uh, you reverence, uh, there was a, a scoundrel I've been trying to keep away from my daughter, and he just shot me. And I, I'm so afraid, what am I going to do? So Bellman, you know, comforted him, and got, got him to a state where he could do his confession, and then immediately got some, you know, some noble people he knew to take her in, and, and to, to shelter her from that. And there's dozens of other stories, they're all in the uh, canonization documents for uh, the original processes for Bellman. In every cathedral back in those days, you had canons, and the canons were uh, clerics, at least at the level of tonsure, and their job was to sing the breviary, the divine office, right? which is, um, if you're familiar with the, the uh, liturgy of the hours, it was much more elaborate in those days prior to the Second Vatican Council. So one of the offices was matins, and that was one of the main offices they had to sing. And it was 12 psalms with a collection of uh, readings, about, about nine in number. They're divided up into nocturnes. And the origin of matins comes from the ancient watches that the Roman soldiers kept. And that's how they, they developed this. So in the churches, you actually had stipends that were paid to those who sang the divine office, the public praise of God, in the churches. And so Bellarmine, as the bishop now, took his seat at the head of the canons. They're kind of surprised by this, right? And so he would sing with them. Now, he's, he's, when he became cardinal, he was no longer a Jesuit, so he was freed from the Jesuit rule. But nevertheless, he still said the whole breviary, as Jesuits do, without any, any, any singing, every single day. And then would take his turn to sing matins every single day with the canons of the cathedral. And if you've ever sang matins, has anyone ever seen Tenebrae, for example, in the 1962, right? Okay, good. It's, uh, so think of that in just a little longer, every day. And that's what, that's what, uh, that's what he did. So in, uh, in, the, in the winters, it got particularly cold, his hands would get frostbitten, but he never used gloves. He would always look at these little sufferings as what he could offer you know, for his sins. And then the money, the stipends, he, he used to relish getting the stipends. That's why he was there every single day. So he'd always get that choir stipend because that was his own money to go disperse amongst the poor. That was the things that he could give to the poor. That was his own. It didn't belong to the church. He didn't have to give it a cow for it. So he always lavished that on all the poor. But it wasn't meant to last. Bellarmine made a special list of all his successors from St. Uh, Priscus, who was a disciple of St. Peter in the Sea of Capua. And then at the very end, after Cesare Costa, he put his own name, Robert del Bellarmino, to last for three years. So, and then of course, within three years, 1605, he was recalled to Rome because it was the papal conclave. Pope Clement VIII died. And then it, the, uh, they had a great difficulty trying to elect a successor. This is one of the things that shocked Bellarmine. You had, uh, everyone's worried about the interests of France, the interests of uh, uh, Spain, who's, you know, who's the more powerful cardinal, not, not about who's going to be the better uh, you know, zeal for, the, for the, the church and for souls. And then uh, Bellarmine's name suddenly flows to the list, right, as all the cardinals fail and they, uh, they can't. And Bellarmine now is the guy everyone's looking to. So then he tells us in the autobiography that he hid in his cell, because back in those days you used to set up cells that made out of wood, and you had to divide them up and you had to live in these really miserable arrangements where you were in conclave, under key. That's right? what that means, under key. So you had to, he, he didn't want to have anything to do with this, but he's there. And so he's praying daily. He says, uh, you know, daily I said, Libera me a papatu, for deliver me from the papacy, o Lord. Because a man who wrote to Clement VIII, as he did, warning, that the Pope will acquit himself by appointing good bishops, but be called to judgment for bad ones. Does not want to be Pope. He does not want to be the person in charge. He just wants to be a simple religious, go back, he doesn't want to be cardinal, right? Go back to his house, or stay in his diocese as a bishop. He truly loved being a bishop, because that's like what it was as a judgment. This is an apostolic office. This is in the Bible. I'm preaching, I'm teaching, and all the things that, that really matter, right? And he taught catechism, too. He, just, he wrote two catechisms, one you can find in the back, the other is a smaller catechism, which you can find on the internet uh, free. So of course, it's in real old English, but he used to go and teach that to all the poor and unlearned in his diocese, even in the country folk. And he would go to the country areas where no bishop had been in hundreds of years, and preaching to the people in the fields. And then he sent two Jesuit fathers ahead of him to prepare the way. And he paid them specially, so that way they wouldn't ask anything out of the people, and the people would be like, wow, we can trust these guys. They're not asking anything out of us. This is awesome. So he liked that a lot more than the very concept of being cardinal, let alone pope. So this was a terrible thing. Then Cardinal Baronius was trying to organize a deputation to elect him came in. And he said, oh, come on, all you have to do is come out, shake hands, be friendly. Why are you hiding out in here? Bellarmine, who was holding his rosary, looked down and said, do you see that piece of straw there? You know, it's a palium, so he says in his autobiography, a piece of straw. And he says, if picking that up would make me pope, it would stay where it lay. 
doesn't want it. And luckily for him, he wasn't chosen, and instead it fell to Camille Borghese, who became Pope Paul V. And here we draw to the end, Pope Paul would be the Pope for a very long time, uh, almost to the very end of Bellarmine's life. And of course, his name is on the front of St. Peter's. So we see it says, Palus Borghesius Quintus, that's at the very front of the new St. Peter's. So what he did is he saw that the construction engraving of what St. Peter's looked like under construction, as Bellarmine would have known it. Well, it, it would go on over 100 years now, and they decided we're we going to bring the St. Peter's to a close. So Paul V and it decides to elongate the nave, which artistically is problematic, and I'm going to lose track if I get into that, so we'll leave that for the moment. And then, uh, so extend the facade. So if you go into St. Peter's and you look in the very first you know, row of pillars after you've come in the, the first part of the nave, it's called the narthex, you can actually see what used to be the outer facade before they had to take it down and elongate it another, uh, uh, another few hundred feet. So Paul V, a uh, decent pope, fairly good-minded, but there's still abuses in the church. His nephew, Scipio Borghese, became really famous for, he was a cardinal, became really famous for his uh, abuses in, in church authority and this stuff. He's also the patron of the great sculptor Bernini, who did who worked so much in St. Peter's. But anyway, so Paul V gets in, and he has a similar mind to Clement the, er, to um, Sixtus V, you know, I mean, not, not exactly Lord of the World terms, but hey man, I'm the Pope. I can make things happen. So the first thing to come up is Venice. Now, the Venetians had suspended clerical exemption, even though it was against the Council of Trent, right? Because So the idea of clerical exemption is that it's the medieval concept of church and state. So when you hear the Middle Ages talked about, they would say, oh, yeah, it's just a theocracy, and the church ran everything, and blah, 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 blah. And it's not true. It's a gross mis uh, misreading of the history. The church had its own laws. It was actually separate. And so was the state. And it was held, basically, by the common consent of Christendom that the church was above the state. And, and, of course, by divine law, the church is above the state as far as religion, not in the politics, not in the, the issues that are not important for the salvation of souls. Those are not the matters in which the church is, the, uh, is, is in charge, of, is over the state. Right? Political law no, has nothing to do with it. But in terms of faith and morals, the church is higher than the state because they have overlapping series of thought, right? That's one of the problematics with thought today, and that's why the church historically condemns separation of church and state, because it's different from the medieval separation of church and state. It so separates them as if they're two different entities. And Pope Pius XI teaches against this in um, Quas Primus, where he instituted the, the kingship of Christ, the feast of the kingship of Christ, that the church and state are actually one with different spheres and different jobs. Well, the Venetians didn't like that either. And the Venetians have a history of being anti-papal in politics, right? So they suspend this, and so Pope Paul V gets mad, puts all of Venice under interdict. And so if you're not familiar with what that is in history, an interdict, uh, interdictere means, to, in Latin means to forbid. So an interdict is a, we suspend the use of all the sacraments in a certain area. So Pope Innocent III did this to England under King John I, or John the Worst, uh, and however you fall from the, that Robin Hood type history. Um, John, the, John the first wasn't a very good king, and so as he was, was trying to tax the church, pull money out of the church for armies and money to go to France. And so this twerked off Innocent III, he said, we've got to solve this problem. So no one in France may say mass, the dead you know, may not be buried in a consecrated ground, we may have no marriages, no baptisms, and that's what it interdicted. So that the idea is the people will get so mad, they're going to tell the king, hey, get right with the Pope, get this settled up, because we can't have this anymore. Well, that was in the 1200s. In, the, in 1606, the Venetians weren't so pliant. In fact, what actually happened is you had a lot of anti-papal feeling in Venice. What they do instead is people who hadn't been to Mass, and, or very rarely went to Mass, said, wow, I never knew Mass was so great. Paolo Sarpi was a very interesting figure in history, um, hated also very opposed to papal power, very opposed to Bellarmine and Bellarmine's teachings. Paolo Sarpi hated the Council of Trent, so he wrote a book kind of tearing the guts out of the Council of Trent, saying it was all it was all forced by the Pope. These people weren't free to discuss, right? So Sarpi gets in a big pamphlet war with Bellarmine. He's a Servite father, and he was known to Bellarmine before this issue, but so he barely ever said Mass. Right? And in those days, in the, after the Council of Trent, the priest was supposed to say Mass virtually every day unless he had a very good reason for it. Um, and so Sarpi almost never said Mass, but when the interdict fell, he said Mass every day and twice on Sunday. That's actually where the phrase comes from. Is an English uh, buyer for writing a history of this whole period. That's where that phrase, uh, every day and twice on Sunday, comes from. 
because from Sarpi, because that's all of a sudden you said mass with this renewed vigor. So this pamphlet war starts between Venice and Bellarmine. So the Pope says he makes uh, recalls Bellarmine out of Capua to be his theologian, puts a new vision in Capua, and says, "All right, you need to write my theology for me. You need to deal with this issue." And he does, and he writes a tract against seven different uh, writers in uh, Venice, and it goes on for quite some time. And then finally, the Venetians and the uh, you know, cooler heads prevail. Uh, unlike Sarpi's, and they say, okay, phew, we'll give you clerical exemption as long as you promise not to abuse it and we'll let all this go. And they did, interdict lifted, and it was the very last time an interdict had ever been used by a pope on any particular place. Because then he kind of recognized this is more of a medieval thing. This isn't particularly something that works in modern times. And still, technically, the pope still has the authority to do that, but, you know, today, but it wouldn't cause, have any effect. So. Then there's another controversy, but I'm going to skip it because there just is not a lot of time left. So Bellman versus the King of England. So this happens over the issues of the English Reformation. Like I said, if I touch any of this, we have another hour. So, um, But basically, the King, after the gunpowder plot, he had to put in an oath of allegiance. And this oath of allegiance was highly problematic. So they, they had captured a priest who had taken it and appealed to other Catholics to do so, George Blackwell. And so Bellarmine wrote a letter to him, which then the English authorities found it didn't like. So King James wrote a whole book defending the Oath of Allegiance. And Bellarmine is the dog days of summer, and unfortunately he's the Pope's dog. So the Pope has said, write back, you can't let him say that, so he writes a whole book back. So King James I writes another book, and Bellarmine just consumes James I thoughts. He can't do business, he can't do hunting, because Bellarmine's book so answered James, and everyone felt he got the worst of it. So then uh, James is like, what am I going to do? And he can't focus on anything. So eventually, well, he writes another book, Bellarmine writes another book, and there kind of rests for a while. And that war goes on with other people. At the very end of his life, though, King James is walking around, and somebody showed him a recent book that somebody had written, one of his Anglican uh, ministers wrote against Bellarmine, and, Bellarmine, and King James said, bah, whatever. But there's more truth to be found on Bellarmine's pages than in every cleric in my kingdom put together. <laughs> so he had uh, he definitely you know, changed a little bit. And of course, like Bellarmine, at the end of his life, James started to looking at and reading devotional books, in spite of his questionable life in various places. <laughs> so now we come to the meat and the close to the conclusion. So Bellarmine continued as a theologian in Rome for a long time. He wrote several books, mostly dealing with political philosophy. And then, you know, starts settling in to preparing for death. He's in his 70s. He's already looking. He's going to die soon. Of course, it doesn't happen like he hoped. And then rolls around the thing for which the only thing for which a secular-minded person has any awareness of who St. Robert Bellman was. And this comes in when Galileo rolls into town. Right? So this is all taken for the church's war against science. The church hates science. Ignore that science was all pioneered by incredible people like St. Albert the Great and Roger Bacon and, uh, well, anyway, you know, names go down, you know, I mean, they used to call seismology the Jesuit science because the Jesuits were the ones who compared notes on earthquake data, and so they created, the Jesuits created the whole science of seismology in studying earthquakes. So at, um, the Church of Science is an old tired hat, but it's a popular one amongst the atheists. So we start with this fellow, Giordano Bruno, and in recent years he's come to start it, and I don't know why. And a lot of scientists that actually know his history are just kind of confused. Why is he in our number? So Bruno uh, was a Dominican friar, and then it simply was that he held to the theories of Copernicanism, Copernicus, which and actually Copernicus' theory is still somewhat Aristotelian. So, and, and I'll talk about, actually, let me backtrack. At this time, everybody holds to what Aristotle teaches. Okay, so Aristotle teaches in the books of the physics that the, the earth is immobile, like other Greeks at that time taught. And that all the bodies of the heavens move around the earth in crystalline spheres, perfectly ordered, perfect circles. Because in ancient Greek geometry, the circle, that's the perfect, the perfect shape. So everything runs around in circles. And uh, you know, if, if you say otherwise, both in the Islamic and in the medieval European traditions, if you say otherwise to Aristotle, that's anathema. Right? And the first Arabs to do it were some Baghdad, and they directly influenced Copernicus. When you read De Revolutionibus, because Copernicus is citing mostly Arabs, actually, that were rendered to him in the Latin translation. So, in like al Batani, uh, Abu Basir Muhammad Abu al Batani, a right? very famous uh, Islamic astronomer. And uh, to the point, he was so brilliant that he looked at a calculation Ptolemy made, did the calculations of the difference between Islamic and Greek dating systems, found out the exact day Ptolemy made this observation in the heavens, and then went to make the very same observation. So really brilliant figures. And so they questioned the, the Greeks' 
enum uh, enumerating the heavens. Because what you did, if you have a planet that just doesn't fit this circular order, well, I, you know what it is. There's another circle, because the circles are perfect forms. So you keep postulating all these circles out of nauseam to explain why these planets don't behave like they should. And the Arabs call said, this is just uh, begging the question. Okay. You cannot, you know, petitio principi is a Latin term for it, begging the question. You've assumed that you're saying in the conclusion, but you haven't shown it. So Copernicus hits on this, but he doesn't address it. He doesn't. He, he postulates these infinite circles as well. He just swaps the Earth for the Sun. That's all he does. And he dedicated the book to Pope Paul III. So Copernicus was actually well received in the church. He was he was himself a priest in Poland, and although he had a mistress, nobody knows about that part. But he was. Um, see, he was a priest, and he had done these things. The first people to come after Copernicus were the Lutherans. Another bit of history that nobody knows is the Lutherans who condemned Copernicus first, whereas he was perfectly at home in the church. He taught astronomy in Rome. Pope Paul III, to whom the book was dedicated, received it very happily. So as long as it was in free opinion, you could talk about it in free opinion. Okay. So then you come to Bruno. So Bruno challenges the whole Aristotelian view. He held certain views that modern scientists promote. Obviously, Copernicanism is one. The multiverse. Anyone ever hear of the multiverse? Okay, so it, it, as the more I hear about it, the more nuts it sounds, but it can, they continue with this because it's the only way, it's like a fudge factor to explain why certain things in modern cosmology don't work. Well, Bruno held to that, and his inspiration was Bishop Nicholas of Cusa, who was in the 15th century. And, but the problem with Bruno is that he was not a scientist, and he didn't believe these things as the fruit of scientific observation like Copernicus or Galileo or Kepler. He believed it because he found you know, ancient accounts of Egyptian mysticism that are attributed to a man named Hermeticism, who was called Hermeticism, and basically magic, right? Mysticism, devil worship. All this stuff comes in, he does seances, he does all these things. So he kind of throws off his Dominican habit, he leaves the Dominicans. And then, but you know, he, he is practicing kind of like a magical alchemy of sorts and calling it science. And so he does hold the Copernicanism and he holds to the multiverse, what we now call the, all these millions and millions of infinite worlds that actually exist, they're not just possibilities. So, and as a result of believing all this stuff, he denies the divinity of Christ, he denies the Pope's authority, he denies the virginity of the Blessed Virgin Mary, as this old fable, he denies major things in scripture, so these are the reasons why he gets a lot of trouble. So he goes all around Europe, basically offending everybody in every place, he goes to England, and he's in John Dee's circle. If anyone knows anything about John Dee, you know how bad that figure was. And of course, he fit in right at home. And John Dee, of course, um, under Elizabeth, the later part of Elizabeth's reign, he got booted out of England because he was just too much of a hot potato. He goes to France, the French kick him out. He goes to Venice, and the Venetians say, oh, no, no, not you again. And they hand him over to the Pope. So Bruno is then in prison. Bellarmine actually spends a lot of time talking to him, working with him, because Bellarmine was on the Congregation of the Inquisition, the Holy Office, the predecessor to the CDF. So he's remonstrating with Bruno, and Bruno eventually kind of sees it, and he accepts the Catholic faith again. And he returns to the Catholic faith, and they're hoping everything's good. The Pope, Pope Clement VIII, gave him a, you know, a salary of uh, more than most honest laborers had every month, plus paper to write with and everything, because they recognized a real intellectual. But then he relapsed. He went back and went to what his heresy. And the law was relapsed heretics had to be burned. And that's the way that the law was of that. And that's not unusual. To us, it looks really harsh. To us, this looks particularly evil and pernicious. And it, maybe it is. But in then, that day, it was not. Everyone burned. Calvin burned people. John Calvin burned heretics uh, right and left in Geneva. Right? And so, in fact, he orchestrated this one guy who was an Anabaptist that he really didn't like. I can't remember the name at the moment, but you find it in all of Calvin's biographies. He tried to orchestrate handing this guy over to the papal authorities to let the Pope burn him. And, and, and of course, it was in France to let the local bishops burn him, and that didn't work. So then he had the audacity to show up in Geneva again. So then Calvin just said, Never forget it, now I'm going to burn you. So nobody, you know, Protestants burned people. Thomas Cramer, the founder of the Anglican Church, he burned people for believing the very same things he believed under Henry VIII, because Henry VIII still held the many points of Catholic doctrine that Cramer did not. So Cramer said, well, I want to keep my authority, so I'm going to burn you. Sorry. And of course, he gets his comeuppance on that, too. So Bruno then is burned, and Bruno is to, sits before the, uh, the inquisitorial board and says, perhaps you fear to give judgment more than I fear judgment. Because that so, so confirmed you. So, but what was this condemnation? He was never condemned for Copernicanism. It was really just a coincidence. He was never condemned for believing that the universe was infinite or believing in the multiverse or whatever they would have called it back then. He was condemned for denying the divinity of Christ, the virginity of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Holy Trinity, 
the authority of scripture, the authority of the Pope, and he goes on. Those are the things he's condemned for. The uh, Copernicanism doesn't even appear in his trial record, uh, in so the original manuscripts of it from the Inquisition. It doesn't appear. I haven't seen the originals, but I've seen a print of them. And it also doesn't, neither does the multiverse appears. The infinite universe appears a mention, but not as a reason for his condemnation. So then we come to Galileo, the more celebrated case, the famous church trying to crush, destroy science, that evil Bellarmine who condemned him. Well, it's a much more complicated than that. Galileo, of course, is an interesting figure, and I don't have time to talk about him that much. But uh, he was very brilliant, but he was also very, very brusque, very uh, convinced of his own importance, and also a bit of a con man. He liked to use the learning he had to kind of fool people. So he would do things like the famous experiment at Pisa. Does everyone know this one where he drops a large rock and a small rock? Aristotle had said in his physics that if you drop a large rock and a small rock, the larger one obviously falls faster than the small one because of the, you know, the, its greater mass. Well, he never went over to the Acropolis and tried it because it's the exact opposite. They both fall at the exact same rate, a small rock and a large rock because the effects of gravity are the same, but Aristotle never observed that. And everyone kind of blindly followed that because Aristotle said it, so therefore it must be right. So what happens is Galileo, just for now, other people had experimented this before. In fact, it was a monk, Jean Verdun, who first theorized it, watched it happen, and then theorized that Aristotle was wrong. And a lot of his work, Galileo plagiarizes. But he does this big major event in Pisa, where off the, the now famous Leaning Tower, it wasn't leaning as much uh, then as it is now, he went and dropped large rock and a small rock, or he had someone drop it, and he measured it. But even then, he couldn't avoid using his superior knowledge of math to try to be a of people. And he said, why? They landed in uh, you know, 9.0 something something seconds. Now, that's normal to us, right? But to a people that don't have, you know, have poorly working clocks, and don't have stopwatches, and don't have any concept of what the decimal is in math, you know, it's, it's almost a level of magic, really. And they're like, wow. They have no idea what that means. <laughs> and of course, he, could, he had no device to measure in that. It's just a mathematics, mathematics speak to uh, trick the people. The Dutch spyglass that Galileo invented was actually uh, you know, supposedly read about in a book, went to a gla you know, glass maker, used a shot ball, cannonball, and uh, used it to grind down a glass to his specification. He didn't do it. Somebody else did it for him. And they got him to make him a whole bunch, right? But he did actually make legitimate discoveries as an astronomer. So I already mentioned how Aristotle's system worked and the ancientness of it. And you know, very few people doubted it. We now know that Jean Verdun, who I mentioned that Galileo plagiarized from, postulated Copernicus and said it could work. But he, he favored you know, the tradition instead. Well, Galileo then observes the moons of Jupiter. So here's Copernicus in miniature, right? And nobody had ever seen those before. So then, you know, this, this throws the whole Aristotelian system into ashes, although somebody did see it before him, it's just nobody knew about it. Tycho Brahe. And Tycho Brahe was a Dutch astronomer and he was living at the court of the Holy Roman Emperor Rudolf II. So he had seen all these types of things and he'd written them down and made these massive calculations which when he died Kepler kind of plagiarized for himself and claimed he made them, although Kepler was a brilliant guy in his own right too, so it's not like he just made everything up. But Brahe suggested that the Earth is in the center of the universe and the Sun moves around it, and all the planets move around the sun. And he ditched Aristotle's circles in favor of the ellipse, which Kepler then took from him and applied to his system, which is just slightly altered for the system we use now, for example, with the Earth, or the sun in the center and everything going around it. So, but for Brahe and all his calculations, this actually showed that everything worked exactly the same, so long as you posited an ellipse and not a perfect circle. Then they, you know, they explain all the things just as well as Kepler's system. So basically, the geocentric system of Brahe and the system of Kepler work exactly the same. And they actually explain all the same phenomena. And so that would kind of play into the issue later. But Galileo is convinced when he sees this that you know, the Copernican system is right. So he goes down to Rome and he gets this great reception in the Roman college. And a lot of the Jesuits are like, wow, this is astounding. And instead of the church hating on science, instead he was receiving and giving these great banquets in honor. Uh, the Jesuit was a very great friend of Robert Bellarmine, Christopher Clavius. He's the one who helped rest, uh, work on the calendar, and he created the uh, using Copernicus's tables, ironically. And so Pope Gregory the Thirteenth issued that calendar, and that's the calendar we use today, the Gregorian calendar. Clavius also has one of the largest canyons of the moon named after him. Well, he wasn't so sure. You see, he's seen what Galileo said, and some of the more intransigent Aristotelians decided to refuse to believe the moons of Jupiter existed. And so Clavius then looks over these things. And, you know, he says, well, it's possible, and these things do exist, so we just have to rework things. But then they saw Tycho Brahe's model, and they make convinced, no, oh, this works. So then the issue comes where Galileo starts teaching scripture. 
we have to reinterpret Joshua 10. And this is where he gets into trouble, because that's the provenance of theologians. So, interestingly, um, Galileo wrote a letter on the interpretation of Scripture, which actually wasn't terribly far from what Leo XIII said on the subject. But Bellarmine wrote several letters dealing with science and scientific method. Even though Bellarmine was not a scientist by any stretch, he understood the scientific method actually better than um, you know, Galileo did, really. So when Galileo goes, so now because he taught scripture, now it all came into doubt. There's much more that goes into it, but he goes before the Inquisition, and so he says, well, what proof do you have? Right? And there's already a scene where he, you know, he brought his telescope and St. Robert Bellarmine looked at the telescope. He challenged the Pope to look in the telescope and see the moons of Jupiter. And Bellarmine pointed, well, the fact that moons go around Jupiter doesn't in and of itself prove the case, because what if there is other motion that was affecting it? And of course, that's an interesting point coming from Bellarmine, because he's just postulating. He doesn't know anything about it. But Hans Turing and Albert Einstein in their 1922 papers postulated that motion is relative to the entirety of the universe. And so that, it, to explain their point, they give what was for them an absurd example. Like I said, they didn't believe in geocentrism, but they postulated if the Earth was in the center, it could be held in the center when you factor in the mass of the whole universe. And that's what Turing says. And it's a, it's, it's a colleague of Einstein. And it's actually really interesting. So Bellarmine kind of postulated that, just throwing it out there, not knowing. But then Galileo says, all right, here's my proofs. And he gave four of them. And all of them were false by modern science, by modern scientific standards, the moons, the tides, things like that, none of which convict the case. And modern science teaches the same thing. You know, anyone who's studied, you know, major physics and Einstein, they know that, you know, the arguments Galileo gave to the Inquisition are all false. So the Inquisition was really read its right when it, you know, condemned Galileo's propositions. But here's how that condemnation went. Um, So first proposition, the sun is the center of the world and altogether devoid of local motion. Okay. And this they condemn for various reasons, scripture and the fathers and other things. Second one, the earth is not the center of the, the world nor immovable, but moves as a whole and also with daring motion. So this, all would agree that this proposition merited the same censure in philosophy in that from a theological standpoint, it seems at least erroneous in faith. Okay. So that's the 1616 decision that was approved by Paul V. And yet, he was still free to teach it. So it wasn't a formal condemnation as absolutely, strictly speaking, heretical. And they said that theology could lead to, to heresy, but he was still free to, to teach it. So then um, Galileo got into some trouble because people passed around the rumor that he'd been formally condemned as a heretic. So Bellarmine, I won't read it, Bellarmine wrote a whole letter defending Galileo, clearly saying, you were not condemned. And so you see, like Galileo, and they're actually in very friendly terms, contrary again to the modern narrative. So he was pleased to write a letter <laughs> defending uh, Galileo and telling him he was not condemned. All's well. So, the, uh, so contrary to that modern, modern notion that we get, uh, you know, and of course that's the only phase of Galileo's life that Bellarmine actually deals with. So then Galileo continues, and of course that, the latter part of the history is well known. He gets into more trouble. He defies the order to teach Copernicanism as a hypothesis, even though he doesn't have the proof. Nobody in that time, not until the 1820s, where the first appearances of proof began to show up. So, the art of dying well. So, Bellarmine knew that he was dying, so he asked um, for the Pope for permission to reside into one of the, the houses for the Jesuit professed at San Andrea de, de, de Quirinale. So, if you're on the Quirinale, it's one of the, the bigger hills of Rome. That's also where the Italian uh, president lives. And, you know, so not too far from there is a great church, Bernini, the great sculptor and architect. He redesigned the church after Bellarmine's death, so it doesn't look like Bellarmine would have seen it. But. As a uh, Jesuit, he, that's the only thing you want to do. He doesn't want to live as a grand old cardinal. He wants to live as a humble, professed religious. And finally, the Pope won't let him out of the cardinalate, but at least lets him live with his brethren. And he composes a work, The Art of Dying Well. Okay. And, and so in this work, you know, he goes on des describing the virtues that have to be practiced by a Christian to prepare himself for death. Right? And so everything focuses, too, on that subject. What's going to happen? All your visitors are going to be gone. All that matters is the love of Jesus Christ and bearing that in your soul so that he finds that love when you come to meet him. And, and so this work was so popular, the Anglicans in uh, 1632 made a translation into English, although not all the parts, because there's some parts that are just too Catholic for them to have. But it was so good, they had to translate it, and there's numerous translations around. I've actually contemplated making my own, but I've recently found one that was really good. Um, so it, rather than go through the labor. Um, to try to get that reprinted. He wrote some other books, spiritual books, um, 
the, the ladder to the ascent of the mind to God by things created. It's another good book. It's out of print, but it's, you can find it in Google Books and archive.org in English. So, so he prepares for his death, and at last, under Pope Gregory XV, he falls very ill okay, in September of uh, 1621. Gets very, very ill, and at last, he's, you know knows he's going to his reward. So the doctors tell him, no, no, don't, don't push yourself too much, you know, and say, see, he's not able to say mass anymore, and he's, he's saying his breviary every day. And then, no, 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 you got to stop with the breviary. And they put him under obedience, and so they took it away and said, alas, I can either say mass or breviary, I've become a layman. And it was part of his humor. So even though he's preparing for death daily, you know, he's also still has his joviality, his humor, his smiles, and so, uh, so he dies uh, in a very holy manner on the 21st of September, um, Sorry, the 17th of September, 1621, and almost immediately they start putting forth, um, you know, to get his canonization going. And so and that's, of course, his body, which you can see now in San Ignacio in Rome. Uh, if you go by, say, the, the Santa Maria Sopra Minerva, which is a great Dominican church there, or uh, the Pantheon, which is a famous Roman monument, his writings on grace and free will were absolutely opposed to what they believed. And so they threatened schism. King Louis XV in France threatened schism if Bellarmine would be canonized. So again, Pope Benedict XIV, uh, who, who was really for canonizing Bellarmine, had a layoff. Then you get to the 19th century, you get Vatican I. And a debate about the old argument about Pope versus Council. Is a Pope above a Council or vice versa? All of a sudden, in the 1860s, this comes to the fore again, as they're planning for Vatican I. Because originally on the scheme, of Vatican I said nothing about papal availability. They weren't supposed to address it at all. Well, they, they did. <laughs> and so the, the reason they did was all these discussions in the press about the Pope, oh, the Pope's not available, all these things are false, right? And then it's the 19th century, we don't believe that anymore, even though it's con consistently been taught by theologians. So the, uh, all the, the Catholic press goes wild with debates with people like Dullinger and even uh, Lord Acton, who was another one, a famous English convert, very much opposed to papal infallibility. So the debate all revolved around Bellarmine. Once again, all what he writes in his pages of papal authority. So finally, in the end, of course, Vatican I defined papal infallibility and using all of Bellarmine's argumentation. And at the very, you know, in the very end, they used to say that Bellarmine was just as important for Vatican I as St. Thomas was for Trent. And so the, finally, in the end, uh, it got tabled because you had the Italian Revolution, you had the Freemasonic Revolution in 1870. It took away the Papal States from Italy. Pius IX had a big program to make a universal catechism for the Church based on Bellarmine's catechisms. And again, to finally to declare him a saint to crown the work. And he had a table because of the Revolution. So finally, you get to Pope Pius XI. And Pope Pius XI, uh, he's looking for, because you have a lot of false ecumenism. Oh yeah, all churches are the same. And so are all, you know, they're, they're you know, some are closer, a little further from the pure doctrine of Christ, but, you know, there's this anomalous Church of Christ, it's the branch theory, right, which is being condemned. So, the Pius XI is looking to confront that with great counter-reformation saints to elevate to the doctrine of the Church, or in the case of Bellarmine, who was the crown of all of it, to canonize. And so he canonized never St. Peter Canisius, St. John of the Cross in mystical theology, uh, he raises to being a doctor of the church. Likewise, St. Lorenzo de Brindisi, the Franciscan, who was also a Thomist, ironically, um, they canonize him and, and bring him to the level of doctor of the church. And finally, Bellarmine's beatified in 1923. And then when Pius XI embarks on this project of raising these great counter-reformation doctors, then he brings St. Robert to the altars. And so, and thus he was, uh, at least until the 60s, you know, held to be you know, the patron of scholars, catechism, one of the greatest theologians in the church's history. So, and that's all I have for this particular talk. Thank you.